It's called the Sunderland Elementary School Committee meeting to order, uh, five o'clock on Thursday, August 13th. All right. Can I get a motion to uh, approve the minutes of May 14th? So moved. Second. Excellent. Okay. Was that, Jessica, you second? Yes. Excuse me, I'll have to ask questions sometimes because I'm taking minutes, so. Thank you, Peter. All right. Uh, any discussion? Okay. All in favor? I would say we had to go through roll call. Uh, Maisie? Yes. Keith? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Peter? Yes. Greg? Yes. All right. Minutes approved. All right, and we have uh, Shelly with us who has put together the uh, the financials uh, so we can have our meeting and uh, let's go to the, the warrants. Hi, um, I do have two dogs, so hopefully they'll stay quiet, but you never know what's gonna happen. So I'll try to mute it if they start barking. Um, but I did provide a, a pretty extensive and comprehensive financial report to the school committee prior to the meeting. Um, we did have warrants that were signed in July. There were eight warrants totaling $56,559.14. These were the last eight warrants of FY20. Um, we did roll over some encumbrances that will get paid in 21 from 20, but those were the last of the actual bills we could pay um, for that fiscal year. And then this year we have had one warrant signed electronically. Um, there were a total of four in the batch for $22,632.73. Um, school committee will get another round of requests for electronic warrants later this month, uh, I think in another week or so. Um, so I, I don't think there's another spot on the agenda for us to do um, a financial update. So I can continue talking about the finances sure. now, Greg, unless you want to come back to it later. Please do. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to read through this entire report. It is pretty lengthy, but I do want to highlight some of the major components and give you a little summary of everything. Uh, I think wrapping up the end of the fiscal year in FY20 went really well. Uh, we had projected to have $110,000 remaining to be spent. Um, between, I think we met just about three months ago around May 15th, um, and we estimated that 65,000 of that would be spent before the end of the fiscal year. Um, that would have left us $45,000 in savings from our budget freeze to be able to take care of that one-to-one -one initiative that we talked about in our technologies to get Chromebooks for every student. Uh, and then we decided to put the remaining money into school choice to help support the level funding of the FY21 budget. So the good news in that is that our expenses were less. Um, we only spent around $30,000 between May and the end of June. Uh, so we ended up rolling over about $80,000, which was reallocated from school choice um, back to the general fund. So that allowed us to put more money into savings for in support of this year. Um, and then that one-to-one -one initiative with the technology ended up being covered fully by the um, Municipal CARES Act grant. So we have mm -hmm. ordered the Chromebooks and uh, the invoices will go to the town and it will get paid for through the Municipal CARES Act grant. So that was great news. We were able to save that $20,000 as well. Outstanding. Yeah, really, really good way to wrap up the year given the circumstances. Um, so what does that mean for school choice? Uh, so our revenue ended up coming in higher. We had talked in May about our revenue being projected at around $80,000 more than we anticipated because of special education increment claims. However, the net of that um, adjustment was only around 62,000 because what they do in your final payment, what the state does is in your final payment in June, they deduct for any corrections from the prior year. And in the prior year, Sunderland had overstated their school cho choice claims by 15,000. So they took that off. Um, so Peter, you had asked directly about that difference and um, that's really what it relates to. We had reported some students in error that actually um, were not school choice. They were part of the McKinney-Vento homeless program and you can't claim them through school choice in that way. So. They made those adjustments. 
Um, and then the changes from the reallocation, uh, we actually ended up having expenditures less than we anticipated of around $100,000. Um, that was partially from the reallocation. And then we also had some salaries and wages that came in less than we anticipated. So the bottom line is that our um, school choice end of year balance was roughly $161,000 more than we anticipated. So that also is great news. Um, we're ending the fiscal year uh, with our actual school choice fund balance just over 320,000. And those funds will be used to help support expenditures for fiscal year 21. Any questions there? No questions? Okay, great. Um, so the next fund that I wanted to talk about was the Early Childhood Revolving Fund. Um, this account we had talked about in May um, because we did not have tuition coming into the school because of the closure related to COVID-19 but we were still paying all of our staff, um, IAs and teachers, and we also had some other expenses being funded out of this account. Um, so at the end of the year, uh, we ended up with revenue being down almost 18,000, but our expenses were also lower. So even though we had some hardship, I feel like the revolving account is still in a good spot right now where we started off FY20, um, we'll talk about FY21 early childhood a little bit more farther down in the report, but we ended the year with just over 44,000 in the early childhood fund revolving account to support FY21 expenses. Um, the special education revolving account is what we're going to discuss next. Those expenditures and revenue were nearly exactly what we predicted. There was no change in any of the revenue sources or the expenditures there, regardless of the closure. Um, so I think we were just under our expenses by about $2,000 um, and we're closing out the end of the year in the special education revolving fund with around $22,000 in support of fiscal year 21. And then our final revolving account to discuss is the school lunch revolving account. Um, if you remember from FY20, there was a change to pay all of the uh, wages and salaries directly out of the school lunch revolving account. That was a big change for last year to try to help support the general fund budget that needed to have some cuts made going into last year. Um, and the school lunch account was also something we were concerned about with the COVID-19 closure because there was limited revenue coming into the school. But again, we still paid all of our staff um, and we still had all of our food costs because we were providing lunches and breakfast to family all throughout. Um, so we did end up with some money still left at the end of the year, regardless of the hardship from COVID-19. We're looking at about $21,000 remaining in the school lunch fund going into fiscal year 21. So overall, I think we wrapped up FY20 in a healthy place, despite all of the changes that took place and the revenue loss um, I'm glad we were able to continue to support all of our faculty and staff through that hardship um, and leading into this year right now um, where we stand, things are in relatively good shape. Um, and if there's any questions about end of year before I move on, I can take them now. Nothing? Okay. Uh, so I did share the general fund first month expense reports for July with you. There's very little expenditures outside of salaries and wages at this point, and then operating expenses such as utilities, um, general overhead, that kind of thing. But there haven't been a lot of expenditures for supplies and materials related to the school yet, which is pretty typical for this time of year because the teachers aren't back. So, you know, I, I think August will see some increase in that, but for July, it was very minimal. Um, the one item that I did want to point out, and I mentioned this in the report, is that our general building repairs line is already at 50% use. Um, this is certainly concerning. Uh, part of that reason is because we have a roughly $7,000 bill in Sunderland to pay for the, um, oh my gosh, it's energy audit. Uh, ben, help me out. What's it really called? Like the system that monitors the energy efficiency of the building, we pay a $7,000 annual maintenance fee. 
um, and they do service our our system several times throughout the year. Um, but that's what part of that expense is. Is that are you referring to Siemens? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Thank you. Um, so, and then we have some window replacements and repairs that are happening. And so that was another $4,000 directly to general repairs, buildings, general repairs. And we might be able to move some of that to COVID expenditures because I understand that some of that work is related to um, increasing the airflow in the building and um, the HVAC systems and a, a classroom maybe didn't have a window or something along those lines. So we might be able to move that back and gain some of those funds back. But right now, um, that account is definitely on my radar. And I have been in conversation with Bill Hildreth, our facilities director, about that. Any questions? Okay. Um, so we'll switch gears again to talk about the revolving funds. So the school choice revolving, um, we are looking at having around $650,000 worth of revenue going into this year with our um, fund rollover plus what we're anticipating taking in this year. We did do an analysis of the existing school choice kids that are at the FY20 end of the year compared to what the school anticipates either kids graduating, kids not coming back, and also looked at kids coming in. Um, and Ben, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was almost an even exchange there for the kids we have outgoing, for the kids we have coming in. So good news is that it looks like right now, unless there's some significant changes, um, our revenue projections should stand where they are right now. Um, and then our expenses, I did make a note here that I went ahead and added $40,000 for COVID related expenses to be paid from school choice. And that's after looking at what we anticipate the needs to be. I wanna point out that that money has not yet been spent. It's strictly earmarked in there and we can save it if we don't use it. We will use all of our grant funding first so that we're taking all of our other revenue sources for COVID related expenses into account before we hit the school choice but I wanted to make sure that we were prepared and did have that money saved. So given the existing expenditures, which is primarily salary and wages and the additional COVID expenses, right now there is a projection of ending the year with about $225,000 in school choice, which will support FY22. Um, I know that seems like so far away at this point, but we're really oh. already, already thinking about how we're gonna recuperate from, from the losses that we're seeing in our accounts. Any questions about school choice for this year at this point? Uh, the 40,000 that you basically have reserved in the school choice, um, I guess I, I, I'm fine with that. I'm just wondering if, the, I'm sure there are different ways of accounting for these various things and to make sure that we we're able to submit as much as possible through FY21 reimbursement under the CARES Act um, and how that affects whether you, you know, where you pull money for, for stuff that's got to be done to the building or so on and so forth. And, you know, either, you know, I don't know if there's a, a better way, whether it's through the CARES Act or through some of these grants you've gotten. Um, and I'm assuming you've got that all under control. I guess I'm just wondering what your, a little more what your approach is. <laughs> Yep, Peter, we are tracking all expenses and anything that falls under the COVID related umbrella, we would try to submit with the for the CARES Act. Okay, because that would seem to me be the first priority because, you know, that's that stuff that's sort of coming to the town as a whole and we might as well access what we can. So the, the thing that we have to pay attention to is the timeline on some of this additional funding and reimbursement. So one of the grants that we have, for example, has a deadline that you have to spend the money by December 31st. So we're accessing those funds first as a priority. We already accessed um, $34,000 in Chromebook purchases from the FY20 Municipal CARES Act funding. And then um, one of the other grants that we did get is a little bit less strict with the timeline. It's a DESI grant 
That one only got the school about $20,000, and we can use that in different ways than the other DESE grant we did get. So I am paying attention to the timelines and the deadlines of when we have to spend the money. And obviously, we will still submit to the town if we can. Um, one of the things that I am hearing from the towns, not necessarily Sunderland, but the all of our towns in general, is that they also have an exorbitant amount of expenditures. And while they want to take care of the schools as much as they can, they have to make sure that all of their departments are taken care of and they're trying to balance that. But I am in really close communication with the town administrators to make sure that the schools are included whenever we can. Um, just to give another example of that, there is an opportunity for an MIAA grant that we just learned about. Ben thankfully forwarded that to me. Um, three of the four elementary school towns right now are going to put in for um, uh, some UV lighting to support the HVAC system. And that was something we weren't sure how we were going to pay for. And we're pretty sure that the towns are going to fund that at this point. So we're constantly looking for new ways to fund some of these additional expenses in um, partnership with the town. So that's definitely on my radar, Peter. Thank you very much. That's great. You're welcome. Anything else before I keep going? Nope. Okay. Um, so our other two revolving funds that we talked about for FY20, we've got the early childhood and the special education. Um, I am concerned about the early childhood account in particular. Our class sizes are going to be smaller and there will be limited revenue because we're only going to be offering um, limited time of students in the building and our special education students get priority over tuition paying students. We are required to provide them the services that they need. So uh, we're only looking at revenue of about $11,000 and that is assuming the projections end up being what they are. And um, that also I should note would change if we went strictly to a remote model um, because it, we likely can't charge families for tuition if we're not teaching students in person. Um, however, even though the revenue is significantly lower, our expenses are not going to change because as I said, we still have to make sure that the needs of our special education students are met. So our expenses, um, while we might be able to take a look and see if we can reduce any staffing right now, what we have planned is what we think we need. Um, so we are looking at ending the year of FY21 with a negative balance of $3,000 based on the existing projections that, I, excuse me, that I have. Um, this is obviously not feasible. We can't end the year with a negative balance. The town's not gonna allow that. And we wanna be more fiscally responsible in our planning anyway. Um, so I will be further assessing once the school plan is firmed up and the staffing plan is firmed up between um, Ben and the early childhood education director. And then we'll take a look from there and I will be making some recommendations on how we can move some of those expenditures off of early childhood onto another funding source. I hope to be able to do that in our next meeting, um, which I'm guessing is gonna be in September. Um, if it is before September, I don't think that'll happen, but you know, I'll do my best for the next meeting to have some recommendations on how we proceed with that. It could be school choice funds. It could be um, some savings that we realize from general fund that can cover this, but we will have to make some changes. And then again, long-term looking at fiscal year 22 to determine how we're gonna pay for the expenses that are required, our teaching staff and other services for special education students primarily, um, we're gonna have to start looking ahead now and planning for next fiscal year. Any questions about early childhood at this point? Okay. Um, the special education revolving fund, uh, we do anticipate that the revenue will be as we projected. Um, we do have a student in there with um, tuition coming in, and then we have uh, planned expenses. So not a whole lot of change in this fund. We're starting the year with about $25,000. I'm projecting that we're going to end the year around $20,000. So we're overspending by $5,000. Um, this is pretty typical for this account. There had been a little bit more of a buildup that we used in the prior year, um, but I think that this account is pretty self-sufficient at this point and doesn't need a lot of discussion. 
Um, the school lunch revolving account, um, this is something again like uh, early childhood we are going to look at because there won't be enough funds left to carry this uh, expenditures through the year. At this point, we're still trying to map out and make some projections as far as what revenue will be. Uh, we don't know if DESE is going to extend the program where all students receive free lunches. And if they do, that would dramatically limit the revenue coming in. Um, and even in a hybrid model, we do anticipate that more students will be bringing lunch than buying lunch. So our revenue stream is going to be down significantly. Now that also means that some of our um, needs as far as staffing might change, our food costs might change. So there's still some, some things to be worked out, but given what we have for expenditures at the moment, just for salaries and wages, um, we will not be able to carry the salaries and wages given the fund balance. So I hope to have more information on that account again in September, um, but we will be looking for alternative funding sources for our school lunch expenses as well. Any questions there? Okay. Um, two more things, I promise. <laughs> So the grant funding we did talk a little bit about, Sunderland to date has received $92,975 for COVID-related grant funding expenditures. Uh, some of that was from the Municipal CARES Act. As I mentioned, $34,500 for one-to-one -one technology initiative was approved for the Municipal CARES Act grant. We have another $20,000 from a DESE grant, Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. Those funds give us a little bit more flexibility. We are using them for COVID-related things such as professional development and technology, but those funds also can be used for other items that would normally paid, be paid for um, through Title I grants. So um, Kim and Sarah Mitchell have worked out how those funds are going to be spent. Um, and, and I think that they will primarily be used for COVID related, but just so you know, they can be used in other ways. They also don't have as tight of a deadline. Um, the other grant is the Coronavirus Relief Fund, also through DESE. They awarded an additional $225 per student based on your foundation budget. So not your total enrollment. That does not count school choice students or um, anything that's anyone that's not included in your foundation budget. So that gave the school um, just shy of $40,000 in additional funding that we were not expecting to have. So we've got $92,975 in grant funding. Um, we've already spent around 50,000 of that, uh, but that includes the technology initiative. So we have around $40,000 remaining and that is before we use any school choice money. So we still have a good chunk of money to, to dive into. And um, Ben and I, Kim and I, you know, all of the, the principals in general, we're, we're in really close communication about what needs to be bought, trying to be um, conservative in what we're purchasing, paying really close attention to return policies on things so that if we buy something that's not what we thought we needed or we don't end up needing it, making sure that we can return it you know, really being mindful of how we're spending the money and at the same time, making sure that the school is prepared for students and faculty and staff to come back. Any questions on the grant funding for COVID? Okay, one last thing I wanna to touch on. Um, Peter had asked this question via email prior to the meeting and I haven't included it in the report. Um, I think Darius could probably talk about it a little bit more than I can at this point, but there was a question brought up about um, any of the cost differences between the different models, the hybrid versus the remote model. Um, we have tried to avoid looking at budget and cost as a driving factor for this um, and really having it being about meeting the needs of the students and the staff, and then we would deal with the budgetary pieces after. Um, however, you know, there is some obvious things that if we were not in person, um, even just a couple of days a week, if we did not have the hybrid model, there would potentially be some changes that could have some cost savings versus the remote option. Um, and I think Darius, do you want to talk about that a little bit more, although there is nothing really concrete to share at this point? 
Yeah, I mean, I think you, you said it, Shelley. Um, excellent presentation, by the way. Um, Thank you. You, know, it, you kind of said it. We didn't, we didn't mock up because uh, we didn't want to make the, the decision. It's not about finances. We have a budget set for this year, and you know, we're trying to deliver a model within that budget. So, um, you know, obviously, if you reduce, um, you know, if you're not bringing students in the building, there's, 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 gonna be, there would be savings. But, um, you know, how things would move. I mean, also how things are planned. Um, there's a lot of other moving factors there because when you talk about <clears throat> a remote model, are you are we doing any services in person as within that remote model, um, and so on and so forth there. So, and what would that look like? So there would be it's not as cut, easy cut and dry um, kind of thing there. So I, I appreciate the question, Peter, but I'm not sure that we can kind of hammer out what it would look like until we um, until we see um, how would we provide anything additional to a regular you know, internet model, are we, are we having people in person? Are we feeding the people while they're here? Are we, you know, what kind of support are we doing? Are we delivering special education services remotely? And or do we need, um, you know, additional, you know, you know, IAs to help out with that? You know, the class sizes and how we're breaking those down. Um, if we were in a remote model as well, you know, what would be the role be of additional support there? Is it needed depending on the special needs in the classroom, so on and so forth. So there's all these different factors. Um, <clears throat> And we could probably map out something, but I didn't, I, I'll be honest, I didn't want that to be the factor. I don't want to be talking money when we're talking about what quality we have a, a you know, a, a council <laughs> budget, um, you know, for education for this year. So that was. Right. No, thank you. I, I, I absolutely agree with you. I don't want money to be the factor. I just also, however, thought, well, we are the school committee and we do have, you know, budget is one of the things that we are supposed to be concerned about. And so. You know, you basically said you've answered my question, okay, to the extent that it is either possible or desirable or whatever. And I don't want to focus on that. I just figured, well, I wanted to check in on it, see if there was anything, any big surprise that you had for us. And there is none. It's just we're we're marching ahead trying to find the best program we can. Uh, Shelley, um, are any of those coronavirus relief grants uh, contingent on having the general student population? return at the beginning of the year or otherwise model? Would we lose any of those? Not that I'm aware of. I haven't read anything or heard anything about that, no. Okay, thanks. Anything else I can help answer financially at this point? No. Sorry, somebody just came in the back door. Um, I'm always happy to take questions. So if you have them, you know, before the next meeting, feel free to reach out to me at any point. Greg, you're muted. Darn it. Thank you so much. All right. I think that brings us to the, thank you, Shelly, that, that was outstanding. Um, brings to the public comment uh, portion of the agenda. Um, we've been getting, I know everyone on the school committee has been getting a lot of emails. There's a lot more uh, parent involvement. Uh, and of course, we, we hear from the teachers right along. I just want to take a couple of seconds on the front end to do a, a quick orientation for uh, folks who, who may be tuning in for the first time or uh, um, just to understand some of the mechanics of school committee versus the, the school administration. Uh, school committee uh, sets policies, uh, but the school administration decides the procedures. So school committee can write general uh, policies in terms of what's gonna get done, but the administration and the staff get together to figure out the how and everything else. Uh, our, our charter is pretty confined. Uh, we look at the policies, we uh, employ, evaluate the superintendent, uh, we approve and work with the, uh, the administration and the staff for budgets, and we are a party to the uh, union negotiations. Um, we do operate under a constraint of open meeting law, so uh, I couldn't ask for uh, a better school committee, uh, but people at home should know that uh, even though we can do as much homework individually as we want to, uh, between meetings, we're not really allowed to communicate with each other except to discuss agendas and times. Um, and 
it's really much more about transparency than uh, than making sure that we can uh, leverage our talents. So if if you ever think, uh, well, we don't hear a lot from school committee or, or they don't uh, answer a lot of emails, uh, you just need to understand that any opinions that we make or uh, reply online or in any chat room that could be construed as an opinion could be considered part of a deliberation. And so really, there's almost a cone of silence that descends on us in between these meetings. So uh, along with that, uh, just a couple of quick tips. Uh, if people want to write in with suggestions, definitely uh, suggesting motions is not a bad thing. So you'll see someone will make a motion and it'll get seconded and get voted on. If you want to suggest a motion, that's that's a really uh, actionable thing. Uh, you can suggest an agenda item. Could you add this to the next school committee uh, meeting agenda? Um, if you do have a list, if you can enumerate it and prioritize it. So, uh, you know, uh, I want to see items one, two, three, so we can respond uh, by the numbers potentially. Um, and if there is any question that's, uh, the answer is one that could be considered deliberation, uh, we have to answer it live during a, an open meeting. All right. And so with that, I, I want to, unless uh, anyone else or wants to add to that, uh, open it up to the public. You can use the chat to to say if you want to uh, make any statements. So Greg, can you just give the, the, the ground rules there? So, you know, people put their names in the chat. Yeah. If you'd like to speak, you'll call on them in the order they're there. Try to keep it under three minutes, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I would actually, that, that's a great point. Uh, um, if the public does want to comment, if you do put your name in there, it's not a Twitter feed. Uh, we're, we're just looking to have uh, names in there of people who want to make statements. And that way we can uh, go through those and, and hear what people have to say, if they have something to say. Aja, uh, go ahead, please. Hi, my name is Aja Cerrone and I co-chair the CPAC. First and foremost, we want to thank you for having CPAC concerns and questions on your agenda tonight. We really appreciate the consideration you're making on behalf of special education students. As you know from our emails, we are deeply troubled by the lack of detail for special education students in the current reopening plans, especially considering the explicit directives from DESE to prioritize special education. Students who need the most complex plans and the longest time to adjust will have the least amount of time to prepare for the school year. Normally, many IEP students would have a transition meeting in early spring, giving them months to prepare for the following year. Right now, there is no official word on when reentry meetings will occur, but it's unlikely they would start prior to teachers returning at the end of the month. That means that families would not know how many days of school their child qualifies for, what services would be available to them, if those services would be in person or remotely, they don't know what health and safety accommodations their child will have, how behavioral issues will be managed, and cannot plan for childcare until days before the school year begins. Even worse, the neediest children will have just days to adjust to all of these major changes after months without effective therapy, regressions, and new disability-related issues like anxiety. It will be no surprise to any CPAC parent when there is an uptick in behavioral issues. Those behavior issues will break every single health and safety protocol being put in place, and that will put instructional assistants and special education teachers at an even higher risk. Beyond that increased risk, we are asking special education teachers to take on considerably more stress. They will have a matter of days to get all these complex plans into place on top of re-entry meetings, evaluations, and annual meetings that are both backlogged from last spring and currently due. Issues with our special education system are not new. They are only coming to light with this pandemic. Families have had to fight to get services put on their IEP and then fight to get the school to follow those services in the IEP. In addition to those battles, they will now also have to fight to get the school to agree that their child meets DESE's definition of a complex and significant needs child so that they can qualify for in-person services. Because even if a child goes to school in person, they still may be getting their therapeutic services remotely from a teacher down the hall or on the days that they are home. 
for parents who do not feel safe getting their child to school, they also have to worry about fighting to get services in one of the places that DESE has listed as an alternative setting. With the IEP process, there are no guarantees, and our parents know that. As an organization, we've heard horror stories from CPAC parents whose special education rights were infringed upon prior to COVID, and we have very little faith that the district will follow DESE's special education guidance with fidelity now. We are asking for the school committee to ensure that they do. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, we have a, a question from uh, Robert Lynch. Can you speak to the motivation for the possible revote on the model of instruction? Um, I'll say that uh, this is a very uh, fluid situation where you know we have fresh guidance from the state, uh, but most particularly the, there was some question about uh, a miscommunication around uh, the circumstances of would, are the teachers uh, going to be brought into the building on a purely volunteer basis, or uh, potentially could they be uh, you know, told that they, they need to either take sick time if they don't have uh, a disqualifying uh, or some sort of qualifying uh, COVID-related uh, susceptibility. So just getting around some of the miscommunication there, uh, and especially with the new guidance, uh, we were gonna have to have a, a meeting anyway very soon the other towns are going to be having one next week but uh if we were going to have any changes we figured we may as well do it sooner rather than later so that uh, that causes us to push our meeting up to today I, I hope that answers your question any other public comment for now all right then i guess we'll call the uh, the public comment closed and uh well, I, someone else the, just entered I'm a sorry. um i saw someone else i think amanda amanda wygant yeah thank you um our daughter is a second going into second grade at ses um and i just want to reiterate um what my comment was on the last district-wide school committee meeting which is i think that we need to be listening to the teachers the educators the staff that take care of our children who are so afraid to go back. We're seeing spots around the country where schools are closing three days in because of one child testing positive and then it multiplies. And I think this is too soon. Nothing with COVID has changed. We have been so diligent in our communities to keep the numbers down that I just think that sending everyone back even two days a week is going to be a mistake and a jeopardize the people that we value the most taking care of and educating our children. So I would like the committee to just take that into consideration, knowing that towns surrounding us have already made the commitment to going remote, including Northampton, East Hampton, a lot of the communities that are surrounding us. And sorry, that's my dog in the back. Um, but we live in a community where we travel across the bridges and it spreads. We have educators coming in from separate parts where kids are going to school in different districts. It is too soon and I just really hope that the committee listens to the voices of those who we rely on the most to take care of and educate our children. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, oh, we've got a question. Uh, legally, what is our responsibility to follow DESE guidance? Uh, Darius, you wanna take that one? So DESE's guidance on this has been that we had to come up with three models. Um, you know, all, everyone back in a something, some kind of hybrid if we chose and um, a full remote. So within the we will be able if we do a full remote model we will have to follow the guidance of the remote model um, which is uh, a lot stricter than what was put out in the new guidance is that we should go back full time um yeah caitlin i think the um they i don't know if they're then putting any new guidance that says we have to go back full time they're leaving it up to local school committees to make that decision 
Um, I don't the I don't think when they rolled out their plan that they were envisioning that everybody was me. Um, not everybody. I think I think around thirty or forty percent of Massachusetts is looking at a remote start at this point. Um, I don't think they were looking at it in that perspective. But um, I'm not sure what your question is, Caitlin. So maybe you want to mute and ask us. <laughs> Meaning that we have to follow the regs of, of whatever plan we go into, we're going to have to follow the regs for time on learning. Well, I, I thought they said that if you fell into the unshaded portion of the, um, with the Department of Public Health, with the number of COVID cases in the county, and our number of COVID cases, I think, are less than four in, in our area, um, that our school district unless we fall into a special circumstance needs to go back full time in person the governor yesterday made a statement saying such when he released the new um that data the data map that showed the the white green and, and yellow orange um things and he made a statement um that said those all those areas in the white areas should be going back to school and be back to school full time um, but I that has not been a, them up. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. That's right. but that, it's, good to, it's good to clarify that though. Um, yes. That's, that's, you know, that's his opinion on that. Desi has not changed their. Okay, great. Their thing. In, a, in a part of legal wise, Desi can't make the school committee do something. The governor can, however. So basically the school committee, um, you know, the governor can shut down schools and the governor can also change, um, you know, decisions made by school committee. Desi cannot change decisions made by school committee, if school committee is acting within their authority. In this particular case, you are. Thank you very much. All right, and I don't know if this is uh, for Ben or uh, Darius. Uh, do we have the, the parent survey that was due yesterday? Uh, yes, and I can um, share my screen um, just so everyone can see what the numbers are at this time. So uh, the survey was sent to K through six families. We have around 176 students enrolled in grades K through six. We had 146 responses at this point. Of those 146 responses, 58% have um, prefer the hybrid model, 41% prefer the remote model, 31 families have not responded yet, um, which is about 17% or so of our total student, student population. Just going through the lists, as you can see, for kindergarten, there's nine hybrid, six remote, four unknown, first grade, 12 hybrid, five remote, six unknown, second grade, 12, nine and seven, third grade, 12, 10 and three, fourth grade, 18 for hybrid, seven remote, four unknown, fifth grade, 16, 13 and six, and sixth grade, five for hybrid, nine remote and one unknown. And that is as of four o'clock this afternoon. Thank you. Yep. Any other public comment? We've got one from Jennifer Smith. I'm not sure, I, Jennifer, do, do you want to unmute and uh, can you explain that? Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, just given that there's been some confusion around the information about the different remote plan versus hybrid plan and, and what, mean, what does that mean on each side, I'm wondering about the possibility of, of parents um, choosing hybrid to get a teacher assignment and kind of see where they would fall, but really feeling unsure and scared about being back in the building. The 
can do be. I'm I'm not sure to. So so I guess that, I guess that could there was um, we have already changed the originally we were talking about using teachers across the district to teach um, students in the virtual classroom. Um, we have now going back to building base on that. That so each um, students will have teachers from their own building. Um, this is because of while the numbers here are um, a lot closer to 50-50 is not the, that case <clears throat> in Conway and Waitley in Deerfield where they have far less um, um, students choosing the remote the remote model. So um, we're, we're looking at keeping the teachers um, working with their with their own town's population. And that was one of the ideas early on. So we didn't know how the numbers were going to go. Um, that we that we put that out there as one of the you know things that we may have to do is share share teachers across the district. Um, we're looking to no longer do that. But again, that's you know I have to I have to put it out there. Then you give them some feedback. You would you um, if you know I understand there's a lot of unknowns on this, and then there's caused so, you know definitely frustrations among families. But there's unknowns for us as we try to create a plan. It's hard to put a plan when you have it's not one or the other. It's both or one, you know what I mean? So, you know, right now we're planning for both two plans, two sets, you know, you have different kind of teaching strategies to go to that, figuring out what students are going into which plan. Um, it's just, it's a, there's so many moving parts and it's happening in five different places, um, you know, cause we have five different buildings in five separate districts. Um, and so that's why there is some things where, you know, I'm asking for some patience from families on that. Um, if their families are trying to choose hybrid because you could choose hybrid and go remote easier than you can go from remote to hybrid. Um, we have taught, we did talk today about, you know, we'll create windows from going remote back to hybrid, um, but you can drop out of hybrid immediately to remote. Um, so some people say, well, I just hide us. So I could, you know, someone could say, I mean, well, people could be signing up for hybrid, you know, and they could drop out. Sure. Um, and that's, you know, that's, you know, that's the, not drop out of school, but drop from hybrid to remote. Um, so, um, you know, those are those are factors in there and you know, whenever you have choice within that you have factors those factors are there So I think that might be what Jen was referring to Any other public comment All right in that case um, Let's see We do have fresh guidance from the state uh, Darius do you want to go into uh, what that is and uh, what it means for us? Sure. Um, you know, we, we were talking about, I'm actually going to put the two, because um, we shared this data with the local board of health, um, the, the metrics that we're creating. So we're basically, we're creating, we're following the state metrics, but we also wanted to create metrics that, you know, we started that were, you know, that really represented this region and some of the concerns that we heard from people when we were creating metrics. And, and Meg Birch, are you out there, nurse or nurse leader? So Meg really did the lion's share of this work, and I want to make sure she gets I am here. gets her face on the screen for it. But also, um, I'm going to have I, we created a quick slideshow um, to kind of go through because it is kind of complicated. I would say, right, Meg? Would you call it complicated? I call it complicated. Um, and so we can we can go through this. Um, let me share my screen and. Um, Yikes. Oh, everybody saw the slides ahead of time. All right, all right. So let me go there. All right. And so maybe walk us through, please. Okay, so um, it is complicated. Um, and so one of the things, you know, when I'm thinking about the indicators, certainly we are getting the guidance from um, the state. Um, and, you know, we also are looking at, um, our local and our regional situation um, and wanting to be able to be responsive to things that are not necessarily captured by some of the um, statewide data um, and possibly even by some of the regional data once those are available. So um, that's sort of a, a little background. And I just, I put the key components for health and safety because I just feel like that this has to be part of any conversation we have about prevention um, is, masks, maintaining physical distance, hand hygiene, and staying home if someone's unwell. Um, 
those really are the components that make a difference. That's why the New England states um, generally are in a much different situation than a lot of other parts of the country. Um, and I think that anybody that heard the governor earlier this week, he was speaking to the fact that some of, you know, some of the compliance with those things um, were being challenged and um, it was driving up the statewide, uh, statewide data. Um, and so, um, you know, it's just a reminder that we all need to do sort of that part of things. And especially for school, the staying home when unwell applies both to students and to, um, and to staff. Um, so next slide. So one of the things I wanted to do was to try to make this again as transparent as possible um, in terms of what data are we looking at, what data are the state telling us um, to use, and where those data are found. So the color-coded metric that they rolled out, um, that is updated on a weekly basis on Wednesdays, um, and that is uh, one of the first pages now in the COVID-19 weekly public health report. Um, and I'll get to those, I'll get to the metric in a sec. Um, the weekly data um, also has um, average daily incidence rates um, for um, town as, and the percent positivity um, in terms of tests over the last 14 days. Um, Daily data um, have the, the number that we'd be looking at from there is a seven day weighted average of positive molecular tests. Those are the PCR, um, the nasal swab standard for testing. Uh, we're also looking at uh, New York Times data, um, their interactive map. They report average daily cases per 100,000 in the past week. And that updated daily. Um, and then last is the Harvard Global Health Institute. Um, they have a, an interactive dashboard. You can look at a uh, state, you can look at a, at a county. Um, those data, I'm just going to note, have a lag. So the data that are available today were updated on Tuesday. Um, and it's so it's important to just when we're looking at data to look at um, when um, the data were updated, and I'll get to more about how we'll use the data later on. So next, so so this is kind of a snapshot of what the COVID command center slash DESI came out with on Tuesday. Um, they are looking at, as you can see, average daily cases per hundred thousand, and um, they are using eight as their highest threshold. Um, their, their, their yellow is the four to eight, um, less than four. And then as, uh, Caitlin, I believe pointed out the white, um, is, uh, fewer than five total cases over the past 14 days. And they see that as appropriate for communities with small populations such as ours and generally very few cases. And those are the 14 day rolling average. So on, if you go to the next slide. So here's, here's their recommendation of, of what happens at those thresholds. Um, so if we're over eight per 100,000, they're recommending remote learning. If it's in the four to eight, they're recommending hybrid or remote, and they note if extenuating circumstances. Um, they don't define those extenuating circumstances, so Absent their definition, I think that our local board of health gets to work with the school to define those extenuating circumstances. Um, and uh, green, if it's less than four per hundred thousand, um, would they're suggesting you could do full in-person learning or hybrid again, depending on your circumstances. All four of our towns are white right now. Um, So that's uh, next slide. So, and trying to think about the data um, because there's a lot of there's a lot of data, and I wanted to try to break it down into um, what would happen with the different data that we're looking at. And certainly, um, and I use primary, secondary, tertiary, um, primary data. When those triggers are met, 
um, the Board of Health would, um, we would be we looking to the Board of Health to make a decision to close schools um, for 14 days. Um, those are statewide data um, based on large numbers. Um, the state has said that they will come out with um, regional data, specifically for schools um, that draw from multiple cities and towns. Um, we don't have those yet. Um, and they're also, um, I just want to note, um, when they rolled out their color metric, they talk about other data they think that schools should be looking at. Um, and those data, that includes trends, so our numbers going up or down or staying level, what's happening with the positive testing. Uh, and then they also suggest that we would consult with our local boards of health um, and school districts would consider what additional data um, would be important. So that's where I kind of, that was, where, that was kind of what shaped this, this, this framework. Um, the secondary, whoop, just go back for one sec. The secondary indicators would, would trigger a short-term closure. Um, and that could be one to three days, it could be three to five days. Um, that would be, a, again, a Board of Health decision with collab in collaboration with the district. And those would be based on our local and regional indicators. Uh, and then the, the tertiary indicators would be us saying something generally with internal data or with trend data that we would be looking at something's happening here and we need to figure out what's going on. Um, we, we have a concern, we have a flag, we're gonna talk with the Board of Health and that could prompt a closure. So now next slide. So the primary indicators, um, the color-coded metric, um, those are average daily cases over 14, 14 days. So we will have those data every Wednesday. Um, also want to be looking at the seven-day weighted average of positive tests. Um, right now that number is, I apologize, um, I I wrote it down. I, that number now I believe is 1.5. Um, it's 1.5 uh, as of yesterday. Um, yesterday I mean, that number is reported today and it's as of yesterday's date on their, um, on their uh, daily dashboard. Um, and then when they provide us with a regional indicator, um, that would be a primary indicator for us as well. So the secondary indicators we're looking at is confirmed COVID cases in the previous 14 days for Franklin County. And I say excluding congregate settings, that, that's, you know, if there's a uptick of cases that are within a nursing home or within a correctional facility, um, that's really, there's no indication that there's community spread. Um, those are typically, you know, by boards of health and public health nurses sort of held aside as, okay, is that really indicative of what's happening in our community? Um, if, there are some people that would argue that a school is a congregate setting. We would not exclude school data. I just want to be clear about that. Um, it really is those other kinds of settings. Um, we're also going to be working to look uh, and, and we'll be calculating this or um, we might have some help from FERCOG. I'm in conversation with them right now uh, or today, earlier today. Um, looking at the percent positive um, is that has to stay below 3% for Franklin County. Um, and then we're looking at combined data for Franklin and Hampshire counties, uh, that there's less than 10 new cases per day or overall um, 70 cases per week. Um, and those are going to have to be weighted um, using, um, I don't know why, uh, oh, the New York Times, uh, we can get the, this county specific data from the New York Times site. So that's where we'll be getting the data to calculate those numbers. And then lastly, for the tertiary indicators, it's trends. We're going to be looking at the trends. Is everything flat? Are things going down? Are things increasing? And if things are increasing, um, that's going to be a flag. And um, the Board of Health and, you know, would say in that instance, let's not wait for it to get to 3%. Um, we concern here that there's some spread in the community. We're not sure if it's in the school. Let's 
short-term closure. Uh, internal monitoring, I think it's important that the school, as school nurses, we're, we're going to be looking at things like, um, and, and this 1.9%, it seems like a random number, but it's actually, um, it's, the, it's the baseline for influenza-like illness. It's a CDC metric. They also have one for COVID-like illness, though I couldn't find a current baseline um, on that. And basically, what I'm, what I'm saying is if we're seeing illnesses, uh, especially, you know, symptoms that are the same presentation, and we have more than 1.9% of building census. So that's staff and students that are showing up with those same illnesses. We've sent them home. That's a flag. Um, if we have a sudden uptick in absences greater than 10% of who we expect to be in a building on a given day, that's a flag. Uh, and then if the local board of health says, you know, we've got, we've got some more positive test results happening in the community, um, that's something that's, that's that um, bring us to the table to have a conversation about what's happening and what's appropriate and safe to do. Um, so next slide. So closures. Um, I want to be clear that decisions are made by the local bo board of health. Um, and, you know, in our case, we have the four towns um, and I we have people that are, um, we have students in different buildings within the district, staff in different buildings within the district. Um, and, um, and we're also working on building relationships with other area boards of health that aren't necessarily the ones for our town. So anytime there's a long, we're going to look at a long-term closure when there's transmission in the community. Um, there's no evidence that the, that the trend is decreasing or leveling out. Um, but it just looks like things are increasing. The 14 day closure, um, so I'm sorry, long-term closure would be greater than 14 days. And that would be, we're really, we're looking like the South, honestly, as, if we're at that place. Uh, and I don't mean to throw the South under the bus, but they're the reddest on the maps of the U.S. So uh, the 14 day closure, um, that's going to be a question of is there community spread? Is there potential for in school transmission? Um, and that's something I've talked extensively with our school physician about. Um, we're, we would only reopen after the 14 days if the primary indicators were below threshold. If we still had evidence that something was happening, um, then it's, it's not an automatic open. I want to be clear that that um, when we talk about a closure short term or medium or 14 day, um, the next decision is going to be based on data. Um, it's not just going to take the days off the calendar. Um, and so short term, the purpose of a short term is to allow us to get a sense of what's happening, to um, allow the public health nurse and the board of health to do um, the community contact tracing. Um, it's to it's for the school nurse and myself in some cases to be working with the local board of health um, to get a sense of what's happening, to talk with families, to see if we can figure out where the uptick in cases came from. If um, you know there's an uptick of cases in a in a cohort, a couple of kids, and we find out they had a pizza party sleepover, and there's no other cases in the community. Um, that presents one picture, we're still going to close to allow um, numbers to and the situation to stabilize. Um, but it's a different picture than we are having cases pop up in all of our schools or in the community. And the Board of Health are, are concerned that that spread is, is really happening at the community level. Um, and all of this is subject to additional data. Um, as we get it. I think that was the last slide. Yes, it was. <laughs> uh, maybe you take a couple of questions if we have any. Absolutely. Anyone? School yeah, I have questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Meg, it sounds to me like we're planning on it. We, we expect that any 
Some situations might merit building-based closures as opposed to all across Union 38, even though the, the buildings are linked through frontier siblings. Are we leaving that flexibility for short-term cl closures to just be building-based? Or would all of Union 38 it, it, I, I guess what I would say, Jessica, is if it's appropriate for building-based, if it's a family that has only children in an elementary school and we can find no close in another in another building, including um, at Frontier, um, and there's no uptick of cases in the other in the other communities. It would be a conversation with the four town boards of health to say we feel okay about just closing this one school. Um, we have talked about siblings. We've we've thought about siblings. Part of the contact tracing that would be happening is figuring out who are the most contacts outside of school. Um, you know, we we can we can do our best to minimize any contacts within a building. Um, we can maintain logs of those contacts so that we can really quickly reach out to um, to families as appropriate to say that there is um, a positive case, and um, a staff member or a student is considered a close contact. Um, we are going to be relying on the public health nurses and the community to respond to them whether it's our local board of health or the mass contact tracers to be um, to be helping with the, what happened in the community. You know, we can't, we can't control what happens at outside activities or what families do outside of school hours. Um, we, we can do our best to, you know, educate and suggest, but we can't control. Um, and I do, I do want to note some people who may have seen an earlier version of this presentation. We did take off the testing data. I had we had that as a tertiary metric. Um, I was on a call today, uh, a meeting that included uh, representatives from Bay State Franklin or Bay State Medical overall, um, Valley Medical Group, the Community Health Center of Franklin County, and we had information from Cooley Dickinson. Um, and they were pretty honest and uh, about the fact that my thought that we would be able to have sort of weekly updates about test returns was kind of a pipe dream. Um, so um, we'll still try to monitor that data, but I didn't want to keep it as an indicator since I can't guarantee we have access to it. Um, I just want to note that there was very strong consensus among the medical providers represented that um, the decisions that a school would make would be based on the D DPH guidelines, um, which is what the local boards of health rely on, um, not the DC guidelines for closure, for quarantine and such. That the, the medical community was pretty unified that this is going to be DPH, should be DPH driven. And that's how our protocols are written. Um, you just mentioned keeping logs of close contacts. Are we asking teachers to keep logs of unexpected close contacts? Or are you just talking about like with scheduling within the building? Okay, um, scheduling to have contact. When I'm thinking of scheduling, uh, or I'm, when I'm thinking of the logs, I'm thinking of us keeping track of, you know, who was on the bus, you know, uh, I don't know the names of the Sunderland buses. I'm assuming there's an S1. Um, so uh, we, would, we would be looking at that data. We would be looking at the cohorts um, and who was expected to be in the building, um, checking the attendance for that. Um, if a staff person was going in to provide um, support in a classroom or, um, you know, that wasn't the primary person assigned to that they, we would be asking them to sign in. Um, in terms of unexpected contact, the best that we are able to track that, we would track that. Um, so, I mean, we're gonna have to have a system. I don't, um, um, I don't wanna put anything additional on the teachers. I think that if we can plan carefully um, especially at the elementary level, I, I'm gonna, it, it's a little. Um, I think I think it's a little easier to to monitor who is out. So who's out on the playground at a given time, or who's 
uh, if there's a transition time, if we minimize how many, you know, there's only one cohort transitioning at a time, well, that helps to mitigate, you know, any unexpected contacts. Um, I saw a question go into the chat, but I'm sorry, I can't, I can't talk and read, so I ignore the chat when it comes up. Um, I've got at least two more questions. Um, okay. And Meg, I, I, I don't want to put you in the position of defending the governor's new um, map and system. Um, certainly you're not responsible for his timing or his comments on it. Um, but I've got two major points of confusion on it. And I was wondering if you could help me understand them. I will happily <laughs> attempt to do so. All right, thank you. So um, one of them is about geography. The governor seems to expect that we are only looking at our four isolated towns and ignoring the fact that lots of our staff and our school choice students come from towns that have higher rates like Greenfield and Montague and Amherst and Northampton and East Hampton. Um, yeah. Can you tell me anything about that? So um, what can I tell you about that? So, uh, you know, they, they, do, they do acknowledge in their other considerations and additional metrics to review that we need regional data. Um, and um, I know that in the conversations I've been having with the public health nurses and honestly also with Joe Comerford's, uh, one of her aides is about the that they are not providing us with regional data. Um, my secondary and tertiary, really the secondary indicators um, are to try to capture that data that they are not providing. Um, so I, I, think your, I think your point is well taken. I think, um, you know, certainly in the call I was on today with uh, medical um, or medical folks, um, it was really clear what questions were going to be being brought back to the state. Um, and I'm blanking on his name, I, um, but uh, Joe Comerford's uh, legislative um, aide was at the meeting today and um, had, had, had stated that he had taken copious notes and had some pretty clear things he was going to be bringing back to um, Senator Comerford for her to bring, um, bring back to Boston. Um, so, you know, the tertiary is, our, is, is, or the secondary indicators is really an attempt to sort of say, we need to be looking at data broader than our four towns. Great, thank you. Um, and then my other question is about sort of the color coding categories and that all of our four towns are in white, which means that we have fewer than five cases. Um, but I'm concerned very specifically that by the time we hit five cases and we register, we are going to be well into the red zone. Yeah. I'm, I'm, population. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, you know, when I looked at the color coded metric, um, you know, I, I don't see the white as translating to full operations. Um, I, I don't. Um, we're, we're, we are a rural community, but we are very interconnected. Um, and um, it's one of the strengths of our, you know, greater Pioneer Valley. Um, I, I, and you know, that's why I, I don't know if you noticed on the slide, um, the options that they were putting as reasonable options under the colors. Um, I bolded the ones that I thought were reasonable, um, which was, was hybrid. Um, at that level, so I don't. And I, I don't, I don't expect our the slides. <laughs> no, it's okay. And um, I don't expect our boards of health would look at that and say, "Oh, white, full on, bring everybody back." Um, that is not consistent with the conversations I've had with the boards of health. Um, they're they're much more cautious as as I feel like we have been at the district level. Thank you, Meg. Okay. Uh, Greg, I got a question. By all means, Peter. Um, I actually wanted to follow up on what Jessica was saying because she's right on the money. Um, and that is that I looked at that map and I sort of figured that based on, you know, it's not just where our students are coming from and where our teachers are coming from, but where our parents are going to work. Um, and that's yeah. routine stuff and let aside, let that, that leaves aside any other 
uh, trips they may take on weekends or something like that. But so I sort of defined in my mind the, you know, the local region um, really has to be something like Franklin, Hampshire and Hamden counties all wrapped up in one thing. Um, mm -hmm. look at, you look at the traffic going up and down 91 every day. And if you yeah. do that, and I tried to come up with what numbers I, I had from, from looking at doing the math as well as I could, and it looked like at that point, you could basically say the whole area was right on the verge between green and yellow. So that that sort of, you know, to consider us in this town or in the four towns in our district as sort of, oh, great, we're white and we're therefore everything's fine, um, really to me is given, you know, a real misleading impression, as Jessica said, um, that, you know, we are, there's obviously no way we're considering the full in situation and, um, it, it just gives you the wrong impression that things are safer here. Okay. Then, um, they really, then I think they really are. Right. No, I, I think I think that's a point well taken. And like I said, I, I sort of saw the white and I thought, uh, OK, I have to put it on there if I'm you know presenting what their metric is. Um, and honestly, for us, you know, any I, I just yeah, I. I to, to me, the white is not relevant for um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want the, any board of health to be making a decision based on that on that map. And I think one of the, you know, some of the feedback that's going back to the state about the map is that they need to give countywide data and they need to give regional data. Um, in the weekly report, you can get data um, for the four counties, for the four Western counties, they're an EMS region. Um, so you can pull that data that will give you numbers um, for, uh, that are adjusted population, you know, adjusted weighted appropriately numbers. Um, I did not look at those numbers today. Um, the last I looked at them, I think that, um, uh, I don't, they were on, I, I, I'm not going to say what I think they were because I've looked at so many numbers, so I don't want to say and be wrong, <laughs> but the EMS data are in the weekly, um, dashboard report from DMA DPH. Um, and like I said, that does cover all four Western counties. Um, does that answer your question, Peter? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to see if I can open the chat. I know there were some questions that were written. And I don't know, um, I guess a point of order um, is um, if those are considered public comment questions or how you want me to manage them. Let's put it this way. Um, great, great point of order. Um, officially, the public comment is closed, but um, let's see, we've got one. Uh, Looks like three or four yeah. questions. I'm happy to answer them. Let's go ahead. Okay. So um, from the public health perspective, we need to mention testing, not data, but actual student staff testing. Okay. So that was discussed today in the meeting I was in. Um, and, um, you know, right now um, for various reasons in terms of the PCR testing, the swab testing. Um, and I'm going to pull my notes. None of, none of the, none of, you know, Bay State and the Community Health Center, um, they're, they're not looking at doing testing that's sort of not driven by a close contact um, or a symptom. Um, and that partly has to do with them wanting to make sure they maintain availability um, for um, for those who are close contacts or who are symptomatic. Um, and I know that uh, Valley Medical is working on getting their testing up and running. All three sites um, are looking at doing sort of what's called um, POC or point of care testing um, to, um, which really would be that rapid test where you would get a result um, in a very short amount of time. Um, so they're looking at rolling that out, understanding that those tests do have a high number of 
um, false negatives and false positives. Um, and the current guidance from DPH, if you do those ra a rapid antigen test and it's negative, you have to confirm that with a PCR, um, which is the nasal swab test. So, um, you know, while I think that, you know, broad testing, uh, you know, is helpful, we don't have the ability to do that. You have to be approved by DPH to do be a testing site. Um, and, and they're not looking to approve schools to do that right now. Um, the other thing I will add about testing that came out is all of the providers, at least uh, Franklin County, I don't think Cooley answered this question. Um, I think it came up in the during the meeting is that they're all, any, any limits they had for age, they're all dropping the age for testing to school age and they're defining that as three and up. Um, so it, the testing is a good question. Um, I, you know, I think at the end of the day, uh, I was talking with um, the um, Deerfield Board of Health person about um, testing after the call. We spoke for about 45 minutes. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, if we think somebody has is a close contact, the Board of Health is going to ask them to quarantine. Um, and the DPH guidance currently is that if you are a close contact, even if you have a negative test, you quarantine for 14 days. Um, and, um, and, and that's what the, that's what the local boards of health are looking to, to follow. So if we could do testing, you know, on a periodic basis. Um, well, we can't, we don't have the capability. I mean, that's really going to be up to, up to the medical facilities and they are looking at how to do that, how to increase that testing capability. Um, but there, as I said, there's problems with the test. So I'm not sure what it, there's questions about what it, what it buys us if your, if your result is, um, you're not sure how sensitive or specific your result is. Um, just to clarify, are we assuming all families are going to be forthcoming with information on how they are treating COVID and their behaviors surrounding? How will the school district ensure kids choosing hybrid know all families on hybrid are following recommended guidelines? Um, you know, as I said before, we can educate, educate, educate. Um, there are, um, we can include this on the website, district websites. There is a reporting number now that was rolled out this week. There is a way to, um, call and report people who are not following guidance. Um, and whether that guidance is masks in public or that guidance is social distancing <laughs> or the size of gatherings, um, community members have the ability to call and report that. And then the local boards of health and the state have to follow up on that. That's the best I can answer that. Um, Certainly, I think if I were to find out from a family that, you know, they had something had been going on, you know, with, I, I don't know. I think I, that would be a conversation with the administrator in that building to, um, and whoever had the information to decide how to manage that. Um, UMass is going to be doing regular weekly, I believe, surveillance testing of all on-campus employees and students. It's currently in the pilot phase. Again, is surveillance testing feasible faculty, staff, and students in the district? So UMass is doing antigen testing. Um, it's going to give them some information. It's going to give them a lot of false information. Um, I know there was news earlier this week. There was somebody in who was supposed to, I don't remember which state governor was supposed to meet with uh, President Trump and had a positive test. That positive was an antigen um the pcr was negative so um i i'm going to be curious how the surveillance testing works out for the for the schools um that are doing it i think where there's a residential population um the rationale is um makes more sense to me because it's slightly more controlled um and then the last question i see is how long for a 
Um, whoops, there's more questions. How long for a PCR to come back with results? Um, they were reporting today, any health center is 24 to 36 hours. They had been an, a kind of outlier in our area and they renegotiated with the lab they use. Um, so they now have an agreement that any results coming from a community health center go to the, um, our, our fast tracked. So they're within the um, 24 to 36 hours, uh, Bay State Franklin, um, in any tests that are done in house, which generally they are, is about 14 hours. Um, occasionally they are sending results out to LabCorp that's coming back um, within 48 hours generally. Um, I did not write down Cooley, but I think they were comparable to Bay State Franklin at this time and Valley Medical is still getting their testing up and running. Maggie, if I may, just a, a couple. Um, so uh, one concern that's been voiced is returning students, whether it's UMass, some of the local schools, um, if we were to experience a spike due to that population coming into the area, uh, when would you expect to see that sort of percolating into the community? Um, generally, what we're seeing is about three weeks. You see the spike based on behaviors, um, based on exposures. Um, I think you start to see cases increasing um, sort of more in the five all right, so might see a little more cases, um, but you don't see the full impact um, generally for about three weeks. And and honestly, a lot of a lot will depend on the um, the uh, contact tracing um, and finding out who else uh, was exposed and um, and on the behavior of those folks. Uh, as I said to Carolyn Ness earlier today, in my experience with contact tracing. Um, the people I have called have been advised already by their medical provider um, to isolate or to quarantine, um, isolate if they have symptoms, uh, quarantine if they feel they have been exposed and are asymptomatic. Um, I have yet to talk to anybody in all the contact tracing I've done since mid-March who was not already in compliance with those guidelines for isolation and quarantine. So, um, I can, I know I had a few people who, you know, as I looked at what I knew of them when I, before I contacted them, I thought oh, this could be really complicated. And then the first thing they said is, as soon as I found out I might have been exposed, I self isolated. I haven't left my house, you know. Um, you know, is everybody doing that? No. Are, are most people, my impression is most people are doing that. Um, that's anecdotal, not scientific, but that's my impression. Other questions from the school committee? I just have the one more. Uh, so there's this uh, percent positive rate on testing that's used as a threshold. I'm just curious. So who's getting tested? Is it people who think that they might be positive or I'm just trying to understand it's not like a random survey of the population. Well, it's it, it's not. I mean, so the people who would be getting tested are um, people who um, are symptomatic, people who, um, you know, the, the guidelines for testing include anybody who is a close contact, whether they're symptomatic or not. Um, I would guess that some of the numbers uh, that drove us down to 1.5 from from just below, we were hovering around 1.8 um, earlier in the week. I would guess that some of those numbers are people who have come back from traveling to uh, states with higher um, levels of uh, positive tests. Um, the other thing that shows up in, um, well, then no, this, so the percent positivity is a PCR. So never mind. I was going to say the other thing that sometimes shows up in the straight maven numbers of cases is if, if I were to get an antibody test and I were to show positive um, and I was symptomatic back in March, that would show up as a maven case. Um, 
it wouldn't mean that I was necessarily, it would mean that I was an active contagious case. It would, it, so, um, that, that can, that can be, um, a factor. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to have multiple data points to look at, um, because I think it is complicated and I think we can't just look at one piece of data and say, that's our answer. Um, and that's going to, that's going to drive the bus. Um, I think we really do need to look at, at, um, the various pieces and um, be in close communication with the Board of Health and the Boards of Health with each other. Um, and as I think many have noted, we need to be looking at the, at the, at the regional data. Um, and I just, you know, I, you know, I think to me, some of these metrics are useful, whether we are, whichever model is voted. Um, because if we're providing some limited in-person services for those students who um, who would have them, we're still going to be monitoring these data to make sure it's safe for even for any level of activity in our buildings. That's that's my feeling about these metrics that they're um, they're relevant regardless of where we go because they really are going to be helping us to monitor what's happening in our community. I have a question, Greg. Yeah, it, a couple minutes ago, there was a question about monitoring um, or the, the lag time between students coming back, say UMass and Amherst, and then where we're going to see that community. Meg, you said like three weeks, something like that. Um, that's, that's my sense of the, of the trends of the data. Um, right. My, my question is though, and this is something that we're struggling with with uh, the summer work is with a lot of visitors that if it's a positive test, it goes back to their hometown, not necessarily where they're at. So unless UMass or say Amherst is producing their own data, anybody who tests positive, it's gonna go not to the our region, it's gonna go to wherever they're from and get counted in their numbers. Is that correct? Um, it comes back to the state. We'll, we'll, we'll get a notice in Maven. I've gotten notices of people who were exposed out of state. Um, it, it will come. It will come back. It will come back to us, because part part of what happens with with the data reporting is if if I if I get a case and it and the zip code initially says that um, you know they're in Deerfield, but it turns out that person is in a long term facility in Essex County um, or in Hamden County. Um, we 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 start with that report. We share it with the other town and then that count goes to the town where the person is physically in residence. So even, even out of state data would come to us. I've dealt with a few cases like that with data from Vermont and from Connecticut. Okay. Yeah, just the one, my a minor concern is like in looking at community spread here, it's we're assuming that there's much more out there because many of the visitors are not here. So the data goes to their hometowns. And so we're struggling with how much, when we look at the daily numbers, struggling with is it truly reflective of what's actually going on here right and i think that's one of the reasons why you know why when we're looking at the data we can't just look at daily numbers we need to look at um at rolling averages we need to look at trends we need to look at you know at the the sort of seven day period the 14 day period um you know certainly if we were to get a, a hand you know say for sunderland if we were to suddenly get six new cases you know, reports of a positive case in Maven, um, that's going to create all kinds of alarm bells, regardless of where those people's original state is. Um, and and if, the, if the address on the test is put in as, you know, Sunderland or Amherst, if they're in a dorm, that's where the, that's the town that's going to get the data first. And I cannot imagine that UMass Health Center would put in Pennsylvania for the residents if they have a student in a dorm in Amherst. Thank you. Does that answer, Keith? Yeah, it does. Thank okay. you. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Meg, thank you so much. That was hugely helpful. You are welcome. You are welcome. All right. Um, 
Dare, if everyone's ready, uh, Darius, uh, I wanted to talk through. I know that we've we've had concerns around special education. There's there's been a specific list uh, regarding uh, CPAC. Uh, I wonder if you could just give us a status update on. Uh, you know, we're focused so much on general ed, a little bit on on where we stand with special education. Yeah, sure, Greg. I did ask Karen uh, Barandino, special ed director, to give an update. Um, she, she, I know she was on earlier. You still there, Karen? Yeah, I'm still here, Darius. Thank you. Hi, Greg. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Karen Ferrandino. Uh, I'm the director of special education. Uh, thank you, Asia, always, um, and the CPAC for your ongoing communication. I know this is really, um, you know, difficult times, and here we are with special education. What we did in special education right now is, um, as you had heard in the past, the Department of Elementary and Secondary put, uh, Education put out its guidance on July 9th. Now on July 9th, what they were really highlighting at that time was that districts were to implement um, IEP services to the extent feasible, um, and also to really look at prior prioritizing our complex needs students and our early childhood students. Please note in that guidance, they also added foster care, English language learners, and homeless students, okay? And so what I think CPAC what I know CPAC is saying is that the individual plans, right? Um, and please remember that special education is a supplemental service. So all our special education students are general education students. And in DESE's guidance, they say that we can't, they understand we're kind of stuck because we can't really, uh, without our faculty and knowing uh, what our faculty situation is as far as returning and knowing our school district model, Coming up with what explicitly what the individual plans will look like is very difficult. There are also their guidance as of Thursday, um, August 6th. Uh, they came out um, with the guidelines uh, to clarify uh, that what the district needs to do is communicate with all families. Um, it does not need to be an IEP meeting. It doesn't need to be a re-entry meeting. It needs to be a re-entry communication. So what we're looking at right now is developing those questions for parents uh, to communicate with them. And then those questions will help us guide us in developing a template to play back to parents what the individual services for the child will look like. And some of the confusion is when you go to implement that IEP, that IEP can be implemented in either a remote or an in-person. It's not an IEP team decision, unfortunately, which complicates things, what services are done in person and which services are done remote. It's the model of the school system and is what is feasible. Our district did put out in our FAQ to Union 38 a commitment uh, to prioritize our complex needs students and our early childhood students. Our complex needs students in Sunderland um, I would say are really defined, uh, the way all districts around us are defining them are students that are in a program, substantially separate program, so out of the general education environment for over 60% of the time. And that's the standard criteria for phase one or opening or getting things started that school districts are really looking at. The complication with that here in our school district is that we're so exceptional at inclusionary programs and we don't want to say because your placement page is less than 60%, we're not going to recognize that you're in a program. Uh, so we're really looking at the students, correct me if I'm wrong, Ben, but uh, we're really looking at the students that were identified or working under what we call their, our CAS model. Um, and we have been communicating with the teacher that took over uh, last year, uh, working directly with those students to really w to see what that would look like. It would be an individualized approach. So we're hoping, and I mean it, but the DESE did say, you know, we would love it if you'd get these communications with families before your faculty come back and get, they put out a template on Thursday as well that would actually show what services are remote, what services are in person, and how the services are different than they are in the IEP, okay? And so we're working on those questions. I should have them done next week. We'll be reaching out to family, but we are in a tight spot. We do need our faculty uh, to really be able to communicate that and get in touch with families and play back to them with a template or any other form of communication. Desi didn't make the template mandatory. Uh, and it's still in the draft form. It will be out later this week or 
the beginning of next week for school districts to use. Um, and then we will do uh, play that back and be able to send out to parents specifically what their IEP services will look like, the how and the when, right? So whatever model we're in, this is how, and this is when your IEP services will be sent out. So um, there are concerns. There were some questions in the, in the CPAC, uh, very comprehensive uh, concerns, things like looking at increasing substantial separate programming, concerns about behavioral issues, concerns about clear masks, um, I don't think I'm in a position right now to address them all, but um, I think there's a point where you need to recognize that the district is being comprehensive in its approach. We have ordered clear masks. Uh, we are looking at the fact that we do have students that are going to need additional PPE, or faculty will need additional PPEs. Uh, we are looking at the fact that some of our students that have more um, self-regulation issues uh, may need to be, unfortunately, or maybe not, we can figure this out, uh, we might need an increase in substantially separate program, and we have been talking about that as making our CAS program more of a substantially separate program uh, and being able to meet needs like that. So it's a compre comprehensive approach. I do admit it in these times that getting, uh, if there's no clear guidelines, besides communicating with parents, prioritizing our students that we recognize are in a substantially separate program to re increasing their in-person in our schools, getting out a document to families that clearly articulate what those supports and services will be is dependent on the model and also our, our faculty, um, what model we're in, what number of kids we have coming in in the building and what faculty we have working. So there's a lot of moving variables. Uh, but we're trying to stay the head of the game and communicate as, as much as possible. Uh, I do have a number of families that I communicate with personally on an ongoing basis. Uh, you know, all communication is good communication, but um, I hope uh, to continue to work with the CPAC and the school committee for specific questions to continue our communication. Uh, and um, it came to my attention that we put a narrative of where we were at as far as special education in the FAQ that went out to Union 38, but there were 24 or 25 questions and the special education one was number 20 um, in those questions and that it would be helpful if that just went out as a separate document to families, um, IAPs, so they could see that uh, as a separate um, document that goes out to all families. So if you have that's kind of a large overview. If you have specific questions, I'd be happy to answer them to the best of my ability. I have a number of questions. Um, first, I want to quickly acknowledge that we're coming close to two hours into this meeting and we haven't gotten to the item that I think most of our 131 participants are here for. I feel right now like there's family members in the hospital waiting room while we're trying to give birth. <laughs> this is, we've got a lot of people waiting for us to get to something else, but I have some really important questions um, that I want to ask. So, Karen, um, you mentioned having reentry communications as opposed to having reentry meetings in a in a pre-corona year. Would you be having reentry meetings with most IEP families? I, I'm only saying that because of the guidance that Desi gave on August 6th. Understanding that 20% of our community is on IEPs, and so every, you know, there's a, a, a huge continuum of, of students. Um, we could do, we certainly in some instances would do remote meetings. In some instances, it's going to be the liaison picking up the phone and interviewing and talking to the parent about what their needs are. And so that would be a screening in order to see whether or not in some ways a, a full meeting was necessary. Uh, when you're looking at um, when you're looking at implementing a service remotely or in person, that's the model of service in which you're doing it. It's not so much an IEP question. If concerns came up when com when the faculty were communicating with the questions that we're asking, in which a child's needs or services changed, the needs of the child changed, that would warrant more of, of a meeting. So we're talking about 315 kids throughout the district and that huge continuum, the guidance at DESE was to do a communication, sort of an interview with the parents as a first step. Okay, um, that makes sense. Um, I, I understand there's a backlog of um, overdue IAP and 504 meetings and evaluations. What is the plan for dealing with the backlog? 
At this time, I would say the backlog is manageable. Um, you know, we did uh, pond, we offered parents the opportunity to have remote meetings at the end of last year um, or meetings in person. So the parent had a choice to uh, continue their meeting into this year, assuming that we at that time would be able to hold in-person meetings. We did start and started to hold IEP meetings remotely at the end of last year. So the backlog isn't unmanageable. Uh, to be able to, well, we will continue to hold remote meetings and we will hold meetings as IEPs come up for annual reviews, uh, meeting federal and state guidelines for the beginning of this year. As far as evaluations, uh, we will be working with our faculty and I need to get our faculty back and our psychologist and our speech language pathologist. The guidance of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is that you can do remote evaluations where the re reliability and the validity of the assessment, uh, there are different assessments in which the reliability and the, and the validity would be viable. Uh, there are some assessments, depending on what information you would look like, be looking for, in which it would not. And then we'll be working with our faculty to do in-person. We do have uh, to do in-person assessments. Uh, different school districts have been doing assessments through the summer. Um, I have not had the opportunity to discuss that with the faculty, so the communication that went out in the FAQ is that we would be using professional judgment um, and the students' needs to determine what evaluations are necessary and do them in a timely manner. And we are there throughout the district, there are a few um, uh, evaluations that we are doing. So what is the likely time frame of settling on services and their delivery for these students this year? I'm sorry, say that again, Jessica. You, you talked about, you know, we're, we're going to have to do the, this whole reentry process and the communications and figure out our staffing to figure out what the services will be and how they will be delivered. When do you expect to get that mostly settled? So right now, as of today, we have an idea of which special education students are being or have chosen remote and which special education students have chosen hybrid. We do also have a sense and have been in communication with many of our, throughout the district, um, of our high need students. Um, and please understand that there are some high need students um, that the question, one of the questions CPAC asked was about using community and um, supports in the home. The guidance of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education on that is if a student cannot receive their services in the school, the school can consider home and community. Uh, so there are some of them in which we have groups of students that receive services like pull out reading or pull out math. Our teachers can already be looking at that and how they're going to work collaboratively to, to give those interventions both uh, remotely or in person based upon the model that um, assumption that it remains hybrid or if it switches we'll have to think about how we do that um, and switch it um, and, and, and continue to think about what model is being used. Um, on an individual level, as things get more complex, we have a number of parents in which we would be communication um, as far as the complexity of their child's needs of, of switching to sub a substan more substantially separate or being in the general education. I guess the answer to the question is there, it's almost like a tiered approach. There are some services that like pull out reading and pull out math and um, many of the students in fifth grade or sixth grade, it's, it's, it's it's groups in which you see we can plan for that and be able to move forward just looking at the numbers that we got today. For our more complex students, we'll be communicating with parents and coming up with a much more individualized approach. To be honest with you, I have some of our more complex students where the parents are asking for specifically just remote services and their children do better with remote services. So we can't really make a blanket statement in any anything and it really, um, but I feel we're going to really have to utilize that two-week planning period. Um, so, and again, a tiered approach, as it always works. 80% of your special education kids or 75% of your special education students, it's very clear in how we provide those services. As you get up into that second tier, into that 15, it gets a little bit more complicated. And then as you get it up to the top 5% or the more complex students, we'll be really looking at that as a more individualized basis. But we're also going to communicate with parents and take into account that students have been out of school for a number of months and may have experienced trauma or different family. Um, um, their needs may have changed or their stress levels, and we will take that into consideration as well. And in those cases, when the needs of the student change, well, that would warrant an IEP meeting. I hope that was clear. Pretty clear. Um, speaking of the two-week professional development period, 
are the special education teachers and service providers going to be able to access the professional development or are they going to be completely tied up doing this reentry stuff? Our caseload, our teachers have a caseload of about 15 students each. Um, our, our students, uh, so depending on the ones that are coming in, so the re-entry, they would be interviewing parents and talking to uh, each of their families, all 15 of them. Uh, mind you, at different schools, some of the smaller schools, uh, the, there has been some reach out already. So for every school, it's a little bit different how that is working, whether or not uh, the principals. Um, and in Frontier, we have an educational team leader that is starting that work. Um, and communicating with parents. So you have a caseload of 15. Uh, my assumption would be that we would be looking at what professional development is essential to the special educators to do that planning um, and what professional development they would have to be, they would not be, I would not assume that all of the planning time is pre professional development, that teachers are going to have time to plan and collaborate and communicate with parents and each other to do that planning and special educators will have to use that time uh, to work together with the general educators and parents. Uh, it, they will, there will be additional paperwork, uh, very similar. Uh, it's not the remote learning plans, but the template is very similar as far as what you're getting out um, and showing when and how the IEP services will be implemented. Trying to look through my questions and figure out which ones you haven't answered yet. Um, can you tell us a little bit more? I, and I think maybe I saw a chat from Asia pop up about this. Um, how how will it be determined which students qualify for prioritized in-person services, whether it's kids in the hybrid model who may be coming for more than a typical AA or BB cohort, or if we do end up in a primarily remote model for the general student population, but still could provide services in person. How will we decide who qualifies for those? And as a specific sub question, if we have kids who have suffered during the closure as you've talked about and may now qualify for say an anxiety or a depression diagnosis, might they also qualify? Um, at this time, what we're looking at as a school district is to put our priority and many other school districts are doing the same into the students that would be in a substantially separate program. I do say again, the way we recognize substantially separate programs and the way the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education had its look at it is called a PL3, where you take how much time you're out of the general education classroom. If it's over 60 or 75 is what they gave, but 60 is substantially separate programming. We would look at that PL3 and that person would qualify as what you call um, in special education, a high needs student. Um, in our district, because we such, do such inclusive programming, it would be hard to just use that placement page. We do recognize that many of our students that we see as program students, their placement page does not show 60% pull out. Uh, because we're so inclusive. We are not going to just say, oh, you're not a substantially separate program student. We recognize that we have the WINGS program students. We have the ALPS programs at Frontier. In Sunderland, we have um, a number of students that access what we would call um, CAS services and do things like that. Um, and we would recognize that some of these students may not have substantially separate program placement. So that makes it complicated, but our focus is on those students that were in those programs in that program model. So it sounds like you're talking about it, and I see here Asia's got a quote that um, Desi has stated complex and sig significant needs also includes any student with an IEP who, quote, cannot engage in remote learning due to their disability needs. So what school districts are doing and what school districts, I please, I am speaking to all my colleagues on a regular basis about this. We meet once or twice a week. It's very clear that um, each school district is doing the same thing and focusing on their substantially separate programming for phase one. If it becomes to our attention that there is a significant high need student, that guidance from DESE is cannot access remote, uh, through our screening and through our communication with parents, that information will be brought to principals and we will discuss it and we'll start to look at what students beyond our substantially separate program students are unable to uh, access remote. We need a starting point, right? It's very complicated and it takes a lot of communication. So our starting point needs to be on the complex needs students that we're aware of their needs right now and we will be reaching out to families 
uh, and communicating and giving it families a chance to inform us that our students' uh, anxiety or self-regulation is beyond control, that they do not think they would be able to access remote, and we'll take that into consideration at the time, and the district will make a determination whether or not that child is able to access remote or not. Please note that we are and want our students in the building and give them those services, but there's a lot of moving variables, and so our commitment to opening day really has to be to the students that are recognized um, as complex due to the substantially separate placement through the guidance of DESI. Yes, they did add, did add the clause, cannot, but I'm also speak, cannot access remote, but I'm also uh, working with the guidance of DESI and communicating with Russell Johnson and others that's giving us guidance how to determine that. And the first step to determining that is communicating with parents and hearing their concern regarding that. It's unfortunate that it's hard, we wanna do it ASAP, but without our faculty and with all these moving parts, it is down to right now, we're going to have our faculty back and start communicating with parents. And there are many parents, many, many parents that I've been communicating personally with and our principals have been communicating with as well. I hear what you're saying. Um, switching gears a little bit to nitty gritty stuff for special education in the pandemic. Um, many children with disabilities are not able to consistently wear face masks or socially distance. What measures, what measures are we taking to protect the people around them? We just had this discussion today. I'm looking up at Meg in my left-hand corner as well. Uh, I got this, but I just want to make sure we're on the same page because all communication with you is important and here you are. So another opportunity for me to articulate it and you could nod to see if I got it. Uh, we do have a number of students. We are working with families uh, with our students who will be unable to wear face masks um, and, and those concerns. Uh, we are looking at uh, faculty wearing both a face shield and a mask uh, and those students would be wearing a face shield and we'd be working with them to be able to do work with a face shield. Um, I would have to be very clear and we would be working on uh, at a school-based level to determine what students those are that would um, not be able to wear the face mask uh, and ensure we have children face shields available, uh, gowns and uh, and face shields for our faculty. Um, that is a tough, you know, it is, that is, a, that is a tough one to really determine. So at a school-based level, we really have to recognize who those students are. Um, I'm very familiar with who they are um, at Frontier um, and have some <coughs> sense of who they are in Sunderland and know that we are communicating with, uh, Pauline, who is was the teacher of CAS, and we'll be working that out. But they may need to be. Uh, it may need to be a substance, as they said in the CPAC letter. There are instances in which we may have to increase the out of general education time for students that are unable to meet those health concerns. Meg, do you have anything to add there? Because I want to make sure that that. That's a tough one. I'm. It's not. You know. Yeah. It. It is. It is a tough one. And I think. Um, I guess I wanted to say two things. Is one. You know, in a conversation I had with the school physician, we talked specifically about that, and and it's one of the reasons why I take every opportunity to say masks, physical distancing, staying home when you're sick, um, because each of those is a layer of protection. So we try to within the school setting, it's about maximizing the layers of protection. Um, we did order um, full PPE for staff who um, could be considered in a um, close, uh, high, high contact, high proximity. Um, and one of the priority trainings in the first days um, for staff would be to, to train those staff on, um, you know, specifically on taking, putting it on, taking it off, but also to have the conversation um, about, okay, on a practical level, what does this look like? Um, for some kids, it might look like the decision might be that that staff person, you know, is going to be wearing a gown all day um, and changing it if, if needed. It may be that there's other situations where they can anticipate a shift in what's happening and the need to be in closer proximity with that student and have the ability to put the gown on ahead of time. Um, that's going to be a very specific conversation 
Um, and, and the goal is going to be to, um, maximize protection for the staff person, maximize protection for, um, for the student. Um, and just to add, um, I know this is Sunderland, but we did have, um, um, our most severe needs students at Frontier, which is our largest school. So it has the most significant, uh, needs students there, uh, outside today uh, with parents and faculty and IAs uh, with training from Meg, uh, working with students an hour and a half blocks to uh, really see how they were working with masks and face shields um, and starting that in-person work. Um, again, at Sunderland, we'll be looking at who is, uh, who is remote, uh, who is looking at the hybrid, um, but I have some sense already of what those parents, which direction they're going in, uh, when we'll be reaching out to them to make those individual plans specifically in Sunderland. Uh, but we did at Frontier this week um, have a, a, a little rollout for our most, most significantly impaired students. I, I, if, I, if I could jump in here, I, I do want to emphasize that my colleagues here at Sunderland, myself, we are not going to let a Sunderland student fall through the, fall through the cracks. Absolutely will not happen. And that's evident from the weekly meetings we had this past spring, talking about students we were worried about. Uh, there's a, um, it was displayed this past spring when teachers met with students over the weekends, when they gave up parts of their April vacation to also continue meetings, when teachers drove to student houses just to deliver a lesson or a packet or a bag of food when our teachers have continued to be in contact with families and students over the summer so you're right but vulnerable comes in many different forms and it's not necessarily just a student on an iep and so you know for the committee members and for for the families that are listening like it's it, it is our job to provide the best experience possible for our students and, and we will not let a student fall through the cracks and thank you, Ben. And I need, you know, I think this is a good time to say, too, this is, you know, very difficult and I know it's very stressful. But I also want you to hear that, you know, I do get emails um, that are positive and thankful and um, people commenting on the uh, continuum of services uh, that we do have in special education and the outstanding special education we have in this district. And I know it's been very stressful times. I can tell you we do not have a humongous backlog of evaluations and IEP meetings, and we will be able to meet them. And we will be looking and working school-based for a continuum uh, of services that take that into consideration where we're at now. And we do need our faculty back uh, to be very clear in giving those individual plans. And I know how stressful it is for our families and and respect that uh, and try to get ahead of it with as much communication as possible um, as we move forward with an understood model that we we have uh, because special education is a supplemental service and is a dependent on our general education model in order to really define that supplemental service I have more questions, but I've been kind of monopolizing our time here. What other committee members like to ask questions? I, I, I'll tell you what, I, I, Jessica, I don't know if you need them tonight for your, your decision and where you're moving as a school committee, but I, I can say this, any school committee member and any member of the public and any faculty member, if you ever have any questions or concerns, you can contact me or you can contact Ben. Uh, we work collaboratively as far as discussing special education and where we're at, because I know there are questions, um, and I hope to get that information. You know, uh, we'll continue to move forward. Could we plan to continue this conversation at our next meeting? I'm sorry, I, I don't know why I didn't hear you. Go ahead. Conversation at the next meeting. We can plan to continue this conversation at the next meeting. Yes. Including specifically next time, I would really like to hear more about um, the classroom removal behavioral standards and protocols. Okay. You're muted, Greg. Anyone else? 
I, I think a lot of what I uh, want to talk about is also in the context of the uh, the next topic. Um, I do, uh, let's put it this way. Um, I feel like we have uh, both the ability and, and perhaps the obligation to make sure that we've talked about everything. Uh, I know that some of the uh, uh, messaging that has come to us from the MTA has come in the form of a bargaining request. And so bargaining is something that we typically do in executive session. Um, but I think while I want to leave the door open to do that, uh, I think I'd like to move the topic forward to the, the possible uh, reconsideration of the hybrid or remote model. Um, and specifically, now we, we've heard a lot about what's going on in the environment and uh, different priorities in terms of what could be done first. Um, can we get an update on, let's say it feels very binary, either it's uh, remote or it's hybrid. Uh, but I've, I've heard people say that, well, it can be slow rolled. It could be an outdoor type thing. Uh, can we talk about what we might mean by hybrid? Ben or, or Darius? What, or, basically, the, the hybrid model that we put forward and where I said at the joint meeting um, that we would be uh, modifying to slow it down from the original conception is the idea that we want to bring the students back in person. Um, and so, you know, the <clears throat> I want to work with the teachers to do that in a comfortable fashion. Um, and where I talked about and, and, and since had more conversations with both at the union level, at the principal's level, and the principals have with the, with the teachers kind of trickle down um, about can we, you know, can we bring in, you know, less students at a time in person um, to make it you know, to make the transition more secure than what we had in the original model. And so that's basically what we're talking about right now overall. And so the idea is to bring them, you know, start with an orientation, then bring in, you know, we were talking about like a quarter at a time instead of half at a time, but quarter, it's all relative to numbers. So, you know, getting, you know, manageable numbers of, you know, seven, seven or eight um, at a time, you know, with the student, with the teachers. The idea of outdoor classes, I mean, that's something that the teachers or, you know, we're, we're providing as a, an avenue that teachers can do. You know, we can't guarantee that students will be outside all day long, which I've seen in some of the threads out there that let's just do an outdoor, you know, students get dropped outdoors, they don't go inside all day long, and they, and they, they get picked up outdoor. For how long is that, you know, possible? I want to create a model that is sustainable moving forward um, of in-person. You also have a lot of, you know, um, things that happen in a building that doesn't happen outside of the building from bathrooms, visits to the nurse, you know, other kind of, you know, other services in that way as well. So the idea is we're going to encourage outdoor learning, especially, again, and I want teachers to be involved in that planning. You know, I want to say you're going to be teaching outside and teachers are like, I don't want to be outside. I want to be able to do this lesson inside, that kind of thing. And it kind of goes both ways. So that's kind of where we left it at the last, you know, meeting um, um, of where we're at, if that's with the, the hybrid model. Now, when you talk about a remote model, with a remote plus a remote with plus something more i mean you certainly can do that it, it's a different it's a to me as an administrator it's a different philosophy so there's a lot of other questions when you start talking about a remote plus model what is plus you know what is the rollout of plus it's a whole other level of planning and you know we certainly can can go down that road um but you know what does that include what is our budgeting to that who's invited to remote plus how do we cohorts of that it's very it's it's not it's not within what was the, the state gave us as guidance so we didn't really go down that road in the planning okay and and i know that i know people are are, uh, are worried about the numbers and such but i also have to come back with and say at what point what number do we need in our community where we feel safe so right now we're under five i mean right now you'd have this kind of these numbers after vaccination came out so, you know, if the, so the question is, if we go to remote, not, and I'm saying I'm, you know, talking against people's concerns and that kind of thing, but I'm saying if we do go remote, then what are the indicators that says it's now safe to be hybrid or safe to come back and, you know, that kind of thing. And then we'll have to figure out, as we just heard, you know, Karen um, talking about how we're we going to, you know, work with special needs students that we, we know we have to see in person. But how does that fit within the hybrid? And then how do we do staffing of that kind of thing as well? So, 
I mean, within Romo, and how do we do staffing and that kind of thing as well? So, it, it, to me, it, 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 those are the issues I see with the two the, when we're talking about the two models. Greg, I got a question. Go ahead, Peter. Um, at the joint meeting last week, uh, I I spoke very briefly, but my main concern um, was about our teachers uh, and about their, um, you know, and I think I said, you know, I'm they, some of them certainly are either in a vulnerable situation themselves as far as COVID or have family members, you know, or parents that are or something like that. And same as my wife and I are, because we're elderly. And I very much understand their concerns and, you know, to be blunt, their fear, okay, about uh, catching this disease, okay? And I think that it's really important for me that as we get through this one way or another, we do it in a way that absolutely totally respects our teachers' concerns. Because if we don't do that, then long term, we've just, you know, we just shot ourselves in the foot because the school is what it is because we have these wonderful teachers and they bend over backwards to take care of all the different kids that walk through this door, this fr our front door. Okay. And you know, we heard people talk about the kids that have got this problem or that problem or this family situation or that family situation and whatever. And it's the teachers that are the ones that are dealing with them. And if we don't pay total uh, attention and respect to their fears and concerns, then we're just, you know, we're not doing it right. Okay. Now, I asked at last week's meeting, um, you know, were the teachers on board? And there was at some point a statement from, because uh, I know that obviously there's some that are very much not wanting to come back to school. And I don't blame them in the slightest. Okay. Um, but there was a statement, I believe, from Emily Tynan that said, to me, it was a very positive statement. It said, as I remember, if I hope I remember it correctly, was, we're all in this together. Okay. And we're going to work with the administration and with um all the other uh people in the schools to figure out a way to make this happen and i guess i'm wondering you know did i hear that right and are enough teachers you know on board with coming back and doing this and so on that we're not disrespecting them you know we're not forcing them we're not uh shaming them we're not uh uh you know, whatever. I think you understand me. I just, it, it really concerns me because, you know, long term, again, we've got to, it just to me so important that we do this right in terms of respecting their situations. So I don't know if Darius, you could say something about, you know, what sort of numbers we've got that are willing to do this. I mean, I look at what you were saying Ben, I look at what you were saying about what the teachers were doing over the spring and over the summer when we were doing the remote learning or in the summer when, you know, there's supposedly no school, but the teachers are still, you know, trying to connect with the students, connect with the families. I mean, they're wonderful. Okay, this is great. You run a, you got a great operation here. Uh, Darius, can we, you know, have we got a reason to be optimistic that that, that will work on the hybrid model that will get enough uh, willing participation? So, yeah, so basically what I did is I reached out to teachers, uh, sent an email out and asked them to, um, you know, put in if, if they're looking for a leave or looking for um, accommodations toward to um, not coming back in the building to submit those to me. Um, and then we also send out the guidance of the different, there's different legal avenues that teachers can take as well. Um, and so if they weren't certain to even just put forward, you know, where they, you know, what their concern is within that, and then we would make a decision from there. So the, here's the issue. So my job is um, obviously you hire me to be the employer of all the teachers. Teachers are one factor of the community. Okay. We also, you know, we surveyed families about their their feelings about coming back, and um, you know, and then you know as well. So 
and then students are the other factors there, but this, you know, the parents are the, and when you look at the three, you have students, parents, uh, <clears throat> and community members. So, so it is a difficult spot. It is a very difficult spot. You I mean, I, I'm looking in the middle of my screen, I'm seeing the MTA logo that says only when it's safe. And that's the MTA's line of, they wanted remote only across the state and they pushed hard back against the state in that. Um, and so there's politics involved as well. And so in the mix of all this, the plan I tried to put forward was that, you know, we would look at what teachers were unable to come back to the building, okay? Um, and with that, looking at those numbers, and looking at the numbers that we have remote, can we get jobs for everybody so that everybody can somehow fit within the equation moving forward? My issue is that right now, I have the numbers of what people put forward, but I'm not sure if I got all the, the we didn't receive a lot of some of the feedback from the teachers. And I think some of it may have been that they're waiting for a secondary vote now. Um, I think that some of it is, um, you know, I don't know, you know, what the, you know, I had a meeting today with the, the association and I asked them to pass along that we really can't plan effectively without having clear numbers. So if anybody else still has a, uh, a, a need to take, um, to be away from the building and not be able to come into the building, to put that forward. Now, there are some that are very straightforward legal ones that, you know, falling under the ADA or falling under, um, you know, the FMLA or the COVID FMLA um, that allow for paid leaves um, and, some allow for you know accommodations that could be away from the building. This is a very, you know, we have these laws that weren't set up for this kind of thing. So we're taking these laws and putting. Then we have some laws that were made for this for COVID, and and trying to interpret how would those different leaves occur. We also have leaves in our own contract, unpaid leaves as well. So there's, there's a lot of different there's a lot of different avenues teachers have for choice within those leaves. Um, the problem we have is if the majority of teachers said. I don't, you know, there was a survey that went out that said about felt uncomfortable about coming back. Well, feeling un taking a survey about feeling uncomfortable about coming back and saying you're not able to come back or do not want to come back is a different is a different question. And I didn't survey people straight up um, for that because this is a it's a political thing. It's not a vote that comes back, okay? And I'm sure you're asking now that you want to make, probably want that number, but. You know, when you're trying to when you're trying to design these things, it's you know with the you know you, know, you have a unions involved and um, demands from the state and that kind of stuff. It's kind of it got us in this situation area now. Currently, like I said, given the number of requests that we have, we could still do two with two models. I mean, we have to remember now that the remote model is still families have a choice of two models. Right, currently, um, they can go all remote if they want, or they can do the hybrid. And then, you know, obviously we're going to try to create avenues, I didn't say obviously, but we're going to try to create avenues that they can have change if, you know, they, their, their circumstances change or they have better different comfort levels or uncomfort levels. Um, so this is twice as hard. I will be honest. If you go remote administratively, it's half the problem remote. It's a lot easier on all of us. So I'm not trying to put, I feel like I'm pushing the rock up the hill about, but do I believe that hybrid is a better model and is more important for our students? I do. And I'm, you know, I'm, I guess I'm paid to, to give you my opinion there. There is risk in it. Um, but I also, I see the risk of, you know, uh, of kids who have been locked away for, um, you know, eight months in certain situations and not had the, the expo you know, having an outside adult checking in on them uh, other than through a screen. And I think the importance of getting, you know, some, try to create some normal sense of normalcy if we deem it safe. Now, if, if the committee feels that all that we put forward is not safe enough, that's what I understand that, and we'll we'll and we'll, we'll go that route. Um, but I'm just this is what my role is to is this. I'm looking at the state that the state's asking us to do. Looking at well, you know, I know people are saying other area schools are doing. Western Mass is very different than Eastern Mass. Eastern Mass got hit a lot harder, yet they're doing a lot more remote. Why is that the case? I mean, a lot more hybrid, rather. Why is that the case? I don't know. Um, I, you know, I don't know, there's different psychologies going on here. Um, so I'm just trying to, you know, looking at data, you know, if we do decide to go remote, what, what do we use for data that says we're, it's now safe to go to hybrid? And so that's, you know, that's you know, my question there. And then, you know, you know we'll, I'll take a, whatever, you know, challenge, the, you know, the, that we have here in front of us in the sense of if, if we, you know, if the choice is to go with the remote in this particular group, there's gonna be a lot, there's a lot of other issues that come up with that. Um, you know, that's why, you know, I do have an executive session on the, on the agenda, but, you know, we'll figure it out. 
you know, and can we do remote plus? Well, I, you know, we'll figure it out. We're not going to just, you know, mail it in. That's for darn sure. We're going to continue to try to buy it as Ben, you know, you know, nicely put. But we have a community that is, you know, a school community is deeply caring. And we'll be going above and beyond whatever model we choose. So I, I, I went off I'm on my speech there. So you can take it back. Darius, I'm trying to hear a clearer answer to Peter's question. Can you give us a sense of how many teachers you're missing information from? I don't know because I've asked them to see if they submitted paperwork. I have what I have for submitted paperwork. So if they, they put in a request that I would be looking for, um, you know, I'm looking for accommodation of, of doing remote learning and we sent them different things and some people filled out different forms. And I didn't care about that, just only that they requested, okay? And so I have a list of those particular teachers, okay? But my, quite, my concern was, is were people holding off until because there was a now a, a vote of remote of a, of a possibility of being remote and they don't want that to go through that paperwork you know in concerns regarding that so right now you know that number is is, is around a handful so you didn't ask the teachers if they were available and willing to come in to do the hybrid to find who has not given input yet i still don't understand what you said can you repeat it so you it sounds to me like you've asked teachers to let you know if they will not be able to come teach in person but you don't know who definitely can come teach in person and you don't know what the gap is of who has not decided or communicated yet is that right right so the difficulties of the laws in this area is that there is no obligation to we don't have any contract language that says if someone decides to go out on fmla they have the legal right to go out whenever they're they need to and so they, teachers or any employee can, aren't required. I asked them to submit paperwork if they were looking on at a leave, but they, 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 they do have the right to make that decision later. So I have no kind of confirmation. I don't have meetings with the teachers where, where we're having this dialogue of back, of that forth, back and forth. And it's also, um, you know, there's also negotiations happening at the same time. And I think some people are waiting to, um, have some of the questions that are in, you know, there's, there's a lot of operational questions that are still, there's a lot of holes in because we're trying to figure out, you know, like how do students get off the bus? You know, well, that looks different in each building. So basically when we had a decision made last week, I said, now we're going back to the building-based teams and the teachers are helping create those patterns because we want them to be a part of those that decision-making since they're going to be running that decision-making. I also have heard from teachers that they don't have enough information to make a decision about whether or not to return. And so, and I don't know, and, and for each one, that may be something different, you know, and, you know, we're, we're trying to get, you know, you know, trying to answer those questions as we develop the different policies, the protocols, um, that kind of thing. And I'm working, obviously, with the union, who's kind of, I would say, double checking our protos, proto, protocols and policies on, the, on that as well, um, so to make sure that, they're, that their association is safe. So a lot of different moving parts there, but I think I, I try to, I think I answered your question there in the sense of, that's why there's kind of, yeah, I think some people are waiting to see because they have the right to wait. Um, I, you know, unless the, we can have an agreement with the association, I, you know, talking with council today, Shelly and I met with council regarding those who applied for different leaves of absences. There's a whole range of them. So we had to run it through with our attorney um, just to make sure we understood them because it is a, it's more than just a checklist. Any person who asks for accommodations um, um, due to either illnesses or, you know, whatever, um, the reason they're asking is an individual accommodation. You don't have slot A, slot B, and slot C. And so you have to kind of do this whole process in order to make sure that their needs according to what their um, requests are in, um, is met. So we went, through, we went through all that. But the one thing we could do, and I talked briefly about it with the association today, is that if I have a, a general overall idea about who's going to put in, you know, the, the association can, you know, go to its association, ask people, you know, ask people to get all their paperwork in on time. I can't force them, not in on time, but in earlier. So, um, but, you know, we talked, I just asked them, right now I think we're at the point of, of a reminder to get that, that information in. Um, even if they don't know where they exactly qualify, we'll help them through that process. And we're going to do an information session as well to help them through. If not even now, what if things change? You know, what kind of FMLA laws are out there that protect, you know, if you have a family member that becomes sick and those kind of things. Um, how to how, what protections you have as an employee under those things?
When you said that um, that you were considering changing changes to the hybrid that would maybe bring fewer number of kids in at a time, at least initially, and so on, can you elaborate a little more on whether that's you know at what stage that is in the planning? So Sunderland is now behind um, because basically I meant we did you know I don't want to say way behind. Ben's gonna will we'll shake his fist at me, um, but. So I did meetings this week with the principals. I met with Ben and we don't really know where things were going. So we, we talked just in general about what their schools are doing and then getting a general outline of what things can look like. We have um, some outlines of calendars, you know, talking about bringing a quarter of the students in for a week then moving that up to a half for a couple of weeks and then bringing, then going into our first, what was, which eventually was, I think was phase two, we go, Nobody remembers any of that stuff. So then go to the two day a week model, full days, um, three days, um, yeah, three days remote um, learning, and then doing that for several weeks, and then when ready, transitioning to a third day a week in a rotating basis. So that's the, but that when you're looking at it now, you're talking about close to the end of October by the time we get to where we were in our original model by the end of September. So um, by adding a slower rollout. Um, you know, again, and I want to, you know, talk with teachers about how they feel about that. And through the, you know, as each building's, excuse me, as each school is building their plans, I want to help, you know, building the schedule. Because one of the things we also have that's also changed slightly from the full 38 to um, each individual school is their schools of needs are very different when you have a building like, like Deerfield that's got 400 kids versus a Conway that's got 120. You know what I mean? So it's a very different, you know, when you talk about a quarter of the kids, you're talking about two, you know, in, in some cases after, you know, some of the remote kids are missing if they already were a small class. So they don't want a quarter of the kids, they want half their kids. And, you know, they may want to escalate that schedule faster. And so because of there's less moving parts, Sunderland's kind of in the middle. It's a medium sized school. It's not really small and it's not the larger school in the district. Um, and that's kind of where, you know, we, and we talked about the positives and negatives of being a medium-sized school. Did that answer your question? I Thank you. Uh, Anyone else? Yeah, Greg, I have a question. Go ahead, Keith. Um, so my confusion came and then we've started talking about it and I appreciate it. Um, I was under the impression, and I said this publicly a couple of times that I wanted to provide as much choice as possible that we, and the, the numbers have shown that we have, we've listened to the teachers, I've read all the emails, but we also um, have responsibility to the people in the community and, and the statistics have shown that they, a number of them want to come back to school. And my support of the hybrid plan, which I still do support because I think face-to-face -face or in-building contact is better, but it does present a higher risk. And, and I had said that if parents or students who wanted to come in the building would have that choice. If they didn't, they could go remote. And I said the same for teachers. Now I'm hearing that they have to take leave or sick time or FMLA. And it, I wasn't aware of that last time. I, I was under the impression they could, that there wouldn't be necessarily leave. It would be if they had an underlying, if they had, it wasn't even an underlying condition. It was if they did not want to engage the level of risk that the in-school presented that they could do remote. And I do think that there are teachers out there who are willing to engage that level of risk. I, I, I do believe that. Um, but I wasn't aware that they were going to have to do like an either or. So my question is, if we have a, a healthy teacher, because with this sickness, one does not need underlying conditions in order to get sick or have serious ramifications. So if we have a healthy teacher and there's no doctor's note, do they have the opportunity to teach remote, remote or do they have to take a leave of absence? It depends on the number of people who've, who've asked for leaves, who've asked for the accommodation. So basically, you're, as an employer, your accommodations would start with those who have medical documentation. Okay, let's just go with this basic straight. Um, there's different ones, but let's just talk about ADA um, accommodations. So basically, and this is an odd... Um, I want to say it's, 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 you know, under the ADA, you know, basically you'd have an accommodation that, you know, maybe something like, I'm, I can't carry the laptop the school has provided me. Can I have a second station? And here's my doctor's, you know, note that says that. So normally when you're talking about ADA, you're talking about those kind of accommodations at work. 
Um, so if you had an ADA accommodation, those we had a doctor's note that said that this due to the condition, you know, due to whatever, um, this, this person cannot be in a, in a school setting um, during the COVID crisis. Um, you know, that's basically what the doctor said. Doctors and sometimes may give recommendations for accommodations. Sometimes they just tell you what the, the issue is. And then we could say, okay, obviously this is a person who's got documentation. So they get, they get first dibs under the protection of the contract as well, because they're protected by the law and, and we're following the contract there. My hope was that those who applied, would, including those who are choosing not to come back without underlining conditions would still be within that number. But it puts us as an employer in a quick West, if we had, let's say we have 70% of teachers decide uh, um, if it's just a choice, I choose remote. Um, and so I will just submit that if they're gonna be blanketly approved. Um, and then we would be stuck in a position as an employer, we can no longer move forward with the hybrid. And I had said at that point, I would be coming back to the school committee if we weren't able to pull this off. Um, to discuss that about are we going to be, um, you know, how are we going to move forward as the employer there? The problem is, is that when you start to, when you create accommodations in this manner, and after talking to legal counsel about this, um, that becomes our new standard. And you have to be very careful about when we allow accommodations that are not medically backed or have documentation toward, you know, medically or you know, have documentation toward, we as employers could put ourselves in a risky position moving forward um, to be able to backtrack that. And so there's ways to do it, but um, you know, it's gonna require working with the association and creating language around that. So it, it is complicated. It is complicated, Keith. And the idea was I wanted, I wanted to see what is the amount it's, you know, if you put it out there as a vote, I think then, you know, I think most people are gonna say right out of the gate that there's gonna be a level of uncomfortableness. But does the uncomfortableness go to the point where they're asking for an accommodation or leave? And that's kind of where we were at now when I put that out there. Um, um, and, and so in the accommodation, whether or not it's back with an ADA or they're just asking for the accommodation without backing of medical documentation. I, I'm, I'm not trying to be flipped, but we're planning, we're setting a bar for the next pandemic. We want to make sure that we don't set a stage for something. So when the next pandemic hits, teachers don't try to take advantage of it. Is that kind of, I'm not sure about like the, the setting of the bar for. So if I gave an accommodation um, for you to work remotely um, based on your um, not being able to come back to million, you don't have any documentation, then you came back and then pandemic, we get a cure. Everything's gone January, lovely. Um, then uh, the next set of person came along and said, you know what, I'm, um, I'm suffering from whatever. I'd like the accommodation to be able to work from home. Legal, you in the past have done it. And, and I say, well, like, do you have documentation? No. Well, you've had past practice where you've allowed that in the past. And so that is the area of, and then, then once you do that, does that change as the school? So the other issue, so you have that issue. So that's, you're creating precedent. Then additionally to that is that once we start off the school year, you have to have a gate of then people could just leave at any time, putting in for leave without documentation. So you recreate this really squishy, uh, um, you know, basically a, a standard for what what qualifies for an accommodation of working remotely. Right. So my, my big concern is like, I didn't have this information when I made my vote. There was never any discussion of teacher's notes, accommodations, FMLA, leave of absence. That never got discussed the first time. And I really do want, I'm going back to school. I think that it's it's important. I am willing to engage that level of risk. And, you know, I see that in other places. I see that in emergency medical response, that there, uh, there are people who are willing to engage a level of risk. And then there, there are others within the group that, don't and they provide that critical supporting role which i would look at as remote and i was hoping that's the way it was going to go i didn't want to get a, a situation where it was and this is what i feel it's kind of come to come in the building or else because we don't have to have that because that's plan a if plan a is coming to building or else then plan b remote everybody's fine so that's why i don't i don't like this confrontation uh, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with this this come in the building or else kind of and i know that's not the approach we're taking but that's the i think that's how it's being felt well, I mean, I can see that the, the how it's come to the building or else, but 
it, at the same time, there has to be an encouragement to come back to the building. You know, um, and, and if we, if we as their employers um, deem that it is safe to return, the state deems it safe to return. At what point, you know, at what point? That's where my kind of thing is. Then what what data points are we using to say it's now safer to return later on? You know, and so um, that that's kind of you know the the rest of the community is is opening up. If if we're going to have and it's fine if we go a different route, but we have to have parameters of why we're doing it this way because you know we are accountable to um, to the the parents and the public of our community to be making decisions in that manner. So. Um, if I may, I think it's important too to underscore what Meg said that uh, if we decided that it was appropriate to the values of our community, we would be handing the big red button to the local board of health. That it's not our decision to keep it going; it's up to them to to supervise and to uh, let us know when they feel that uh, conditions may no longer be uh, safe. Right. I mean, it's, I mean, I think we're in a, I just got to tell you, I've been reading, a, you know, a lot of different, you know, you know, there's a lot of people are kind of publicizing now how they feel about the situation school committees across Massachusetts have been put in and superintendents as well, um, having to make these, making choices that, um, you know, I think, you know, I think we got set up by the state in a very difficult way and people should be very upset by that, um, that they gave a very loosey goosey kind of setup. Um, if you read the, the superintendent of situate, for those listening, you can kind of look at it on the side, but he did an open letter to the governor that really spells out just where things are at. You know, they kind of dumped the big problem on school committees. They said, we like local decisions. Meanwhile, you can't open a bar without, you can't open a barbershop without having direct, clear communication from the governor about how that's going to happen. But schools, we're going to come up with three different plans and each community is going to figure out and devise their own. I mean, I'm looking at Meg Birch, who's put in hundreds of hours trying to create medical guidelines in order to keep our buildings safe. And I'd be, you know, I'm beyond, you know, beyond tired, beyond irritated. We have so many moving parts here. Um, but I do also want to say I appreciate that you didn't ask to be put in this position. I remember talking with one of you about, or one of the school committees in the district about, you know, I didn't sign up to be school committee to be making life and death situation questions. You know, I talked, I joined the school committee to get more funding for public schools. So, I mean, we're really in a, you're in a tough spot. And then, um, you know, and I, God forbid, you know, I don't want to open up schools and have, God forbid something happens and goes wrong. You know, I, I, you know, it, I don't sleep well anyways. So it's, you know, it, just putting it out there that it's, it's a very, it's not cold calculated school trying to move the, the bus forward. It's, you know, you know, we're, we're here, you know, as we planned our way to get to this spot. So um, I think, you know, the committee, you will make a decision and we'll, um, and then we'll, you know, obviously whatever the decision goes, we can have another meeting. Um, we moved your meeting up, but if the meeting requires us to have another meeting earlier next week to, to, to finite some of those details, like I because I don't, your meeting next week, if you had your meeting next week, we would have had a better clear picture of the calendar for the rollout. Um, and so, you know, maybe, you know, that kind of thing, but you do have to, you know, you do have to make a decision regarding hybrid or remote because the school has to know which way it's going to, it's going to go. Unless you want to come up with a third option. <laughs> is there a way, my question is, is there a way that we can go forward? I mean, I, I would really like to be able to provide the community and I, and I see numbers about half the community would like to try to, to meet in person. Is there a way we can do that without putting teachers in a situation where they have to come in or take a leave of absence? Especially if one is, is healthy without an underlying condition. I mean, I would, I don't want to make any assumptions for teachers. I, I do know their daily acts of bravery that people I see it all the time with my other jobs. Um, but is there a way that we can go forward without saying, come in the building or take a leave of absence? Because if we can't, I would have to say that I would have to go with remote. I mean, after a long pause and thinking, we would run into the problem of being unable to staff the building for hybrid. So 
the idea was that the hope there would be that we didn't have we percentage wise we had a, we had those who needed to be away from the building um, whether documented or not um, would be equal or close there to what our needs are and once it comes out of those needs um, in fact I have one building where I have the opposite need where um, if I was to go off the current applications um, I would have to ask the teacher to teach remote classes because the in-person ones there's not enough there's too many in-person teachers you know what I mean so it's, it's going to be you know in that one we're working out and that, that's an e that's an easier problem because there's less you know um, we can share and that kind of stuff but so that's what I'm saying unless I had the firm if if the if the Sunderland Teachers Association has their own unit I guess because um, we also are a difficult unit there because we have our own contract with each school that's also that's collectively bargained um, you know they you know if they did a you know wanted to do a straightforward survey and we could have that information um, that would answer your question but then you'd also be answering the question that that's that's what's dictating your you're making you're saying that the, the, the vote of the teachers return is that is is the is the vote of what model we move forward and so when we were putting this thing together there was a, there's a lot of politics statewide that says not to go that route because you know you had the mta pushing at some points we're saying we weren't going to we're not going to go back to work until all the schools agreed to a remote model there's a lot of different language and as you read and caught up in that made it you know it had to be couldn't be straightforward you know what i mean it it, it, it made things more complicated than it have to be I was on. I was, I was, I'm sorry, uh, Greg. I, I just want to to add that I, you know, I still keep in mind there are a lot of families that have voted that want to send their kid to school at least a couple days a week, and you know that's that's a service we're supposed to be providing. And um, I don't know. I mean, Darius, with the families that have said that they're going to be going all remote, we obviously need teachers for them because somebody can't be teaching them while they're dealing with their hybrid group. And is there not enough, does that not give you enough flexibility to handle the, the hybrid situation? Well, so it's a complicated question. Meaning like it's, it's we're trying to do twice as much by having two options rather than one, one, you know, one school option. Right. And even within our planning, you know, we heard very loud and clear from parents, um, you know, it, from across all districts, they were very upset about hearing that they may not have their teacher from their building, um, from their town. Um, and so, you know, we made the adjustment there as well. Um, and also because, you know, I'll be straightforward, we also had numbers that helped us say, you know, we don't have to do it that way. We put that language in there because we were concerned that we would be, we, we may need to have to share resources across the, the district um, in order to get things done. Um, so it is going to be, it's going to take a lot of creative, you know, in a lot of our plans is talking about teaming of teachers and, and, and maybe even sharing, um, lessons and crossing over between classes where a teacher might teach one part of one lesson, one part of another. There's a lot of this out of the box thinking that's great, um, to make this happen. It's not as clear as you got one group of students, one teacher, one group of students, another teacher, and it's just going to move forward, plow forward because you have a lot of extra things that have to happen too from, you know, um, um, additional services that students receive and, um, you know, the, the, you know, teachers working together, um, you know, when you have part days in and part days out, you know, how can we work them together so they can be supportive of one another um, in their job? So it's a difficult question, Peter. I, I it probably sounded more confusing than was helpful there. So are we going to vote, Greg, or what are we going to do? Here's my thought. Uh, first, I want to thank everyone for their uh, patience and their stamina. And uh, we've definitely danced around uh, bargaining issues very closely. Uh, but I think it makes sense to move briefly to executive session because that's sort of we're, we're dealing with some bargaining issues. Uh, get that out of the way and then come back in session and vote. 
and just a Greg, a point of order on the vote. In order to do yep. a revote, someone from the affirm side has to make the motion. So someone Understood. who voted in and, and for it, just to just make sure that you're following the, the protocol there. Oh my goodness. <laughs> All right. Uh, I guess I can make the motion to go into executive session. So uh, pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 30A, uh, Section 31A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining, um, I move that we move to executive session. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Uh, all in favor? Let's Fine. see. Peter? We need to make a statement as to returning, and we have some. Oh, yeah. Sorry. And, and we'll, we'll return. Uh, I don't imagine uh, it'll be longer than 10 minutes. Um, and then we'll return back to this channel. We'll return back to this session. Yep. And uh, resume the discussion and uh, vote and hopefully adjourn. So I will be stopping the recording but keeping the live feed of this session going. We got in trouble with FCAT last time. We went to an executive session and there was this big, long, recorded middle. Just letting people know what's going on here. Then we need to vote. Roll yep. call. Oh, yeah. You have to do a roll call going. Sorry. Yep. Then I'll stop the Peter. Peter? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Uh, Keith? Yes. Maisie? Yes. Greg? Yes. All right. So I'll, I'll see you at the, uh, the executive session.